All right, joining us this evening on piano, please rise. We have Eric Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Helmut, for that rousing and rendition. <laughs> All right, tonight we're going to, um, we're in a special town meeting, so I'm going to ask that only reports and announcements having to do with the meeting be presented, that we not have the usual, thank you, that we not have the usual um, everybody and their brother getting up, just anything having to do with the meeting only. Um, turn your cell phones on to vibrate, please. Um, in your packet that you received, you re got a letter from Miss Lucarelli. Remember last spring, we authorized um, electronic distribution of town meeting materials, uh, your notices, and all of this stuff that the selectmen were kind enough to send to us. We'll be able to send it all to you electronically, but to do that, you have to fill out that piece of paper that came in your mail and get it back to um, Stephanie. You could hand it to Miss Weber in the back and I think she has extras if you want to pick one up and fill it out if you haven't done it. It also asks your email address and phone number and if you want to have that public or private and is the opt-in box. So if you want to do it, fill that out and check it in, but fill this out anyways. So I'm going to give mine now. I did it. Okay. Um, I have no other remarks. Miss, any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? Good. I recognize the Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, Ms. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is requested that members of the Board of Selectmen and elected officials of the town, town manager, department heads of the town and staff, superintendents of school and staff, committees, commissions, and boards of town, Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical School district committee and superintendent, members of the general court representing Arlington, and also any consultants who have been retained to work for the town relative to articles to be acted on by this meeting, representatives of interested parties of Article 1, and special representatives of the news media be permitted to sit within the special town meeting enclosure. All in favor of that, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? Hearing none. You should all have your clickers by now. We're going to do a test vote. Tim, whose last name I forgot. Not now. I hope that's not a boating. One second. All right, I'll do the constable's return. Uh, Madam Clerk, do you have reason to believe that this meeting was appropriately called by the Board of Selectmen and that the constable made a return of service on the warrant in accordance with the laws? She does so certify and declare. Ms. Mahan? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the special town meeting is not disposed of at this session when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, October 24, 2016 at 8 p.m. Second. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Okay, that means you want to finish tonight, which we probably can if we work at it and don't talk a lot. All right, you ready yet, Tim? Not yet. Okay. Um, announcements and resolutions. Ah, none. What do you know? Oh, you got one, Adam? 
Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. I just wanted to take the opportunity to introduce the new assistant town manager, Jim Feeney, who's here with us tonight. Jim used to work a... Uh... Stand up, take a bow. <laughs> Some of you uh, know, uh, may know Jim from his work at the Board of Health for a number of years before coming over into this role, so we're very happy to have him on board and um, glad he's here. Thanks. Thank you. Article 1, reports of committees. We call that all reports of committees we received. Ms. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the Board of Selectmen's report be received. All in favor? It is so received. Ms. Foskett. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the uh, report of the Finance Committee be received. All in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed? It is so received. Mr. Yervig. Mr. Moderator, I move that the report of the Capital Planning Committee be received. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. So received. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Andrew Bunnell, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. I move that the report yeah. of the Arlington Redevelopment Board be received. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? None. So received. Um, yes. Um, I move that the report of the Community Preservation Committee be received. Set. All in favor? Aye. Any other reports or committees? Mr. Foskett. Mr. Moderator, I move that the recommended votes contained in the respective reports of the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen be before the meeting without further motion. All in favor, please say yes. yes. All opposed? All those recommended votes are now before the meeting without further motion. Are you ready now, Tim? Okay. Get your clickers out. The test question is, is Hong Kong the world's noisiest city? One for yes, two for no. Go ahead and vote as soon as the light goes on. Go ahead, vote. One for yes, two for no. <laughs> the answer is yes. Ah. Okay, he's going to scroll through the screens, check your clicker, make sure you were right. There are three precincts per screen. Mr. Foss, could you lay Article 1 upon the table, please? Put Article 1 on the table. Mr. Moderator, move that Article 1 be put on the table. All in favor of laying Article 1 upon the table, please say yes. yes. All opposed say no. Article 1 is on the table. That brings us to Article 2. We have the Article 2 recommended vote of the Finance Committee for no action. All in favor of no action, please say yes. yes. All opposed say no. It's a recommended vote of no action. I so declare. And that brings us to Article 3. 
Mr. Carmen. Here we are. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dean Carmen, Precinct 20, and a member of the Finance Committee. Town meeting members, Article 3, I'll put the recommended vote up here, and I'll read it that the sum of $4 million being hereby is appropriated to fund expansion of the Thompson School and for cost incidental and related thereto, and with the approval of the Board of Selectmen, the Treasurer, the treasurer is authorized to borrow $4 million under and pursuant to Chapter 44, Section 7 of the General Laws as amended or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're good enough. So what are we doing? So tonight what we're requesting is that the town meeting approves an appro a borrowing appropriation of $4 million to fund the addition on the Thompson School. So I think the first question people might have is, didn't we already do this? We had a debt exclusion vote. You know, isn't this, isn't this done? And, and so what I put in the slides behind me was just was, was an expl explanation, and that is a debt exclusion vote is not an appropriation. It's, it's an authorization to spend money outside of the limits of Prop 2 and a half. So in June when we went to the ballot and we voted to you know, support this, th this project, we, we voted to identify a funding source. Now we're coming back to town meeting to actually appropriate the money, because no matter what the debt exclusion says, no matter what an operating override says, town meeting, you guys, are the sole authority to appropriate money. So where do we currently stand? So when I was up here, when we were up here in January 2016, we were back in May, we were talking about school enrollment, we were talking about the growth uh, of school children and how the kindergarten cohorts are coming in at a much greater number than the fifth grade cohorts are leaving. That trend is continuing. If you look at the slide behind us, what I have is three different points in time five years ago, enrollment five years ago at Thompson, enrollment projections in Thompson as of August, and, the, and what we expect to be the Thompson enrollment in five years. And what, what you see is the trend that we've been consistently talking about, that the these smaller cohorts are leaving Thompson. These larger, I mean, really massive cohorts are, are showing up. Also in the, in the spring, one of the things we had mentioned was, you know, even though we, we were going out for the debt exclusion, even though we were asking you to support it, we weren't going to move on it until we, until we had validation that the kindergarten class that was entering Thompson was, was going to be a large class. And the projection in August was 90, the, the enrollment in August was 94 students. I know it has some volatility, so let's just say for the sake of discussion, it's above 80. And that trend is going to, is going to continue. So I'm assuming, so you know, when I, when I put this presentation together, I started to think about the different questions that were being asked. And the first thing I thought about was, well, I'm asking you to uh, support a bond authorization of $4 million, but, but what's the project actually going to come in at? And the good news I have for you is we've gone out, we've, the, the town has done bidding, they have two bids right now. One's for about $3.8 million, as you can see behind me. The other one's for a smidge over $4 million. So under the procurement laws, you go with the lowest bidder unless there's a, qual a quantitative or qualitative reason to which you disqualify them. Then you go to the second bidder. Under either scenario, I mean, the project is looking like it will, you know, will come in on budget. Modular classrooms. You know, I, again, anticipating questions, I, I figured I'd talk for a moment about modulars. As everyone probably remembers, in January 2016, the Finance Committee asked you to endorse the funding of two modular classrooms at Thompson to provide a temporary stopgap for the enrollment crunch. But this time, this time last year, they were one classroom short of what they needed. And so the modular, I haven't seen them, I have to be honest, I live on the west side of town, I rarely ever cross over Pleasant Street. Um, I'm, I'm being told the modulars are there, they're in use, they're being used, they've taken, uh, they've alleviated this year's enrollment pressure. So they brought the capacity of the school from 19 classrooms to 21 classrooms. The challenge though, when I go back two slides, is we're projecting that the classroom, that the, 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 audit, the, the Thompson is going to need 24 classrooms when it reached peak enrollment. And so while 21, the two classrooms in the modules give you a, a, a one year stopgap, it doesn't stop what's gonna happen next year and the year after and the year after. So, so rather than just spending a whole bunch of money on modular classrooms that get you nothing in the end, you know, the plan, under, the plan currently is to put the addition on, which will give us five classrooms and a core space, 
you know, make it permanent, get through the enrollment, take the modules out of there when the building's online, and, you know, do both what's, you know, best for the children academically and programmatically, and also what's fiscally the most responsible path. Additionally, when you look in your, in your vote, you're going to see this paragraph at, at the, you'll see this section at the bottom of it. Anybody that's been in town meeting, I was assuming they were going to look at this and say, what the heck does this mean? So mm -hmm. um, rather than Mr. Leonard coming up here and beating me up and making me feel dumb, I figured I'd just explain it up front. And so what's going on is the Municipal Modernization Act, as some of you saw, was passed over the summer. It had some really good changes to municipal finance law that make things more efficient, and this is one of them. Previously, what would happen is if we would do a bond offering and we would receive a premium for our bond because of the delta between our stated rate of interest and the market rate of interest, let's say in this case we put the bonds out there for $4 million and we got $4.2 million back in, in bond premiums. We would have to take that $200,000, bring it back into what's essentially a reserve account and amortize it into free cash over the life of the bonds. It's really not a great fiscal thing to do because you've asked the taxpayer, the, the taxpayers raised $4.2 million on the debt rule, on the debt exclusion, and it's being amortized back into free cash. What this legislation allows us to do is if we end up in a scenario where there's a bond premium when we go out to the market, so in that same hypothetical scenario, we ask for four million from the market, we get 4.2 million, that $200,000 can be used immediately, to, not immediately, but it can be used as debt service to just relieve the bond obligation and bring it back down to four million. It's a good thing for the taxpayer. And so we ask you to support the Finance Committee's recommended vote. Um, obviously, if you have any nice things to say, I'll be over to the side. If you have any not nice things to say, Adam's right behind me. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carmen. Anyone else? Right, we're going to stow over here first. Um, Christian, Mr. Klein, oh, you don't want to talk. You got your hand up. Oh, right behind you. I'm uh, Gary Tibbetts from Precinct 5, and I'm a very close neighbor to Thompson School. And um, I don't have kids in school anymore, but um, I, I definitely will support this article. Uh, educating the kids is the most important thing we do. Um, but I, I want to be up front. I went to a lot of meetings about this, and um, I talked to one uh, member of the school committee, you know, and I told her, I don't see how you people didn't see we needed this back when we were building the school. And she told me that, well, they kind of did, but in 08 and 09, we were, when the decisions were made, we were entering a recession and they didn't feel comfortable asking the voters for more money. And as I said to her, I would have much rather you hit us for another million or a million and a half then than four or five million now. And the other thing about it is doing this now, it puts a very active construction site next to the, one of the busiest grammar schools in the town. And it's dangerous. Accidents happen on construction sites. So I want the school committee and the administration to be positive that this is the size school we need and that everything is right about it. And secondly, you know, I bump into a lot of the neighbors and the parents in Precinct 5, and I feel where I have this position, I sh you know, they, they talk to me about things. And one of the issues is the traffic around Thompson School. It's gotten horrendous. There's more kids, more parents dropping them off. And the other issue is there's a new um, thing on GPS. I think it's called Wave, where it directs you around red lights and stuff. Well, there's a lot of out-of-town traffic must come down 93 to 16 to River Street and take a left on University Road, which just happens to be my street. And it's right around the time all the kids are coming. I watched the police lady almost get nailed three or four times when I'm walking my dog. And all of them have a GPS on and no kids in the car. So they, they're just using it to beat the light at, at River Street. So I've talked to the town, uh, town and this manager. this relates to Thompson How? Yes, it does. Okay. I've talked to the town manager and the police department. And I've asked, especially with the construction coming up, when we're going to be adding all the construction vehicles and, the, and that traffic, that there'd be a no left turn sign put at University Road and a stop sign at the end of it to slow this down because it's, it's getting dangerous and with this construction, that's how it relates. Um, going forward, I'd like to see the school committee and the school administration look more into some of the corporate grants that are available 
for public education. Our neighboring towns do this on a regular basis. I looked into this with Bill Hainer, who was very helpful. We really can't see anywhere that the town of Arlington looks for these grants. Our neighboring towns are getting them. Gary, that's a little far afield of the bonding for the Thompson. Okay. You're talking about school budgets. Okay, that, that, okay. we'll let it go then. Um, the, other, the other issue with the funding for the school is when the building is done, I would like the town and the officials to look it over and make sure it's right. And if it's not right, call the contractor on it then and get it fixed. Because so many times I've sat in this room since I've had this position and had people come to me and tell me they needed a couple hundred thousand for this or half a million for that. They, they tell us that because something wasn't right from the get-go with the bracket school or the police station or whatever. The town of Arlington with these contracts has the, the contractors by a completion bond. So even a year later, you can chase them down if they're out of business. The insurance company goes against them. And I, I just think that, you know, that's something we should follow through on more, and I'd like to see the administration follow through on that. Okay, thank you. And again, you. I do support it. Mr. Roster. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Adam Oster from Precinct 3. Uh, and I fully intend to vote for this, um, but I think this is a good opportunity uh, for us and for the whole town to, to hear how it sort of came to pass that we are in the situation of just a few years after finishing the school having to make significant changes to it. Um, I've heard things. I've never really heard the full story, and uh, we've got um, uh, uh, on our plate, we've got renovations to the high school. We've got uh, the uh, um, Minuteman renovation that we, or, or excuse me, rebuild that we, that we just approved. Uh, and I'd like to hear what lessons we've learned, if any, uh, and how we can be sure that we won't make this kind of mistake again. And I'll just sit down. Mr. Schlickman, as a school committee person, can you tell us how we got a school that's not big enough? Uh, Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. When you go to build a new school, uh, you have to go before the uh, MSBA, and part of the negotiation is the size of the school. And you have to justify the, the size of the school based on a projected enrollment. And we haggled with the state for a considerable time uh, on, on the size of the enrollment and came to agreement the number. Now, remember, this was going on around 2008, 2009, at the time that we were in a deep recession and the bottom was falling out of the real estate market. When I came back on the school committee in 2012, we were in the process of finishing up our redistricting, which was mandated by the state. They were concerned we didn't have enough kids in the Thompson district to fill the school, so when we went into the redistricting in 2012, we were adding territory into buffer zones to put more kids eligible to go toward the Thompson School, 2012. The bulge in enrollment is recent. There's a demographic change to East Arlington in particular. My building as well, I live in a 47-unit condo building which never had kids. Now I'm tripping over baby carriages. We have a new generation of millennials who don't want the house in the suburbs, they don't want the two-acre zoning, they don't want the commute, they are willing to live in smaller quarters in a dense urban community in order to have the amenities. And that's the demographic trend we are seeing and the reason why, particularly in East Arlington, we're having an expansion of the number of kids that we did not see in 2008 to 2010 when we were negotiating with the state for a new Thompson School. Thank you. Thank you. Does that answer your question, sir? Yep, thank you. Ms. Memon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Lorena Memon from Precinct 21. I'm also in support of this uh, article. Uh, I think, however, since there's a 200,000 that is possibly a spare, I know the architect is found from Cambridge. I saw that the project is supposed to be started uh, November 1st. However, I have not heard anything about energy efficiency, and that is a concern to me. I know we do have an energy manager um, that uh, we share with another town, and we have uh, lots of projects going on, but I have not heard that anything for this school as well as for the high schools or for even for the other projects that we're t undertaking, like Jason Russell House and um, 
the Schwab mill. I was wondering, uh, could that be addressed? Could, did somebody discuss that in the meetings? Mr. Carmen, you're going to build us an energy efficient building? Adam's going to answer it. Adam Chapdelain, town manager. So town bylaw requires that all build, uh, large building renovations and reconstructions are built to a lead silver standard. So the, the town has already put in place a requirement for us to build sustainable buildings. The Thompson building, the original Thompson building, was certified as a mass chips verified leader. That's the lead silver equivalent that the MSBA was recognizing at the time of that construction. It's my understanding that this addition can't in and of itself receive an extension of that mass chips verified leader certification or its own. It is, has been designed to match up with all of the specifications and the use of all the sustainable materials that were included in the original I construction. I understand the lead, um, uh, the measure. I think that re relates to insulation. It's not the energy source. Is I, am I c correct on that? No, lead, lead goes ac across the board from the, uh, the water usage, uh, use of materials, uh, recycle, uh, recycling materials that you're taking out of the site, possible renewable energy, access to bus routes, bike racks, uh, lead okay. goes from, from But we're not talking nuts. anything about solar, wind, geothermal, or anything that's efficient, energy efficient boilers or anything? So there's solar on the Thompson right now. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that we, we're, we don't have plans to extend it to this new roof, but we would certainly consider it if it was appropriate. Okay. Thank you for answering my question. Thank you, Mr. McCabe. Mark McCabe, Precinct 2. I stand to terminate debate on Article 3 and all matters before it. We got a motion to terminate debate. It's been seconded. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It's a two thirds vote, and I so declare. If it's bonding, we're going to use our clickers. All in favor of the recommended vote of the Finance Committee is printed in your report for bonding. Please press one for yes and two for no as soon as Tim gives us the green light. Okay, go ahead, vote. One for yes, two for no. One to vote. issue the bonds, two you don't want to. Passes by a vote of 193 in the affirmative, five in the negative, and I so declare it. The bond passes. 193, two, five. That ends Article 3 and brings us to Article 4. Um, Ms. Rowe. The appropriation Hello. CPA for the Jason Russell House. Yes, thank you. Um, and I've talked to the town um, moderator and well, I asked... Ms. Rowe has the floor, please. Um, I'm Clarissa Rowe, Precinct 4. Um, I'd like to talk about both properties. We're coming to you tonight to ask for $55,000 for two properties, $35,000 for the Jason Russell House and $20,000 for the Old Schwab Mill. Um, I'm very lucky to have my very excellent committee here and then we also have um, a number of the board of directors from the Old Schwab Mill and also from Jason Russell House, if you have detailed questions. Uh, the reason we have not brought these two very worthy projects to you in the past is because historic preservation projects need a lot more paperwork to go with them to get CPA funds. And we have been working over the summer, Doug Hyam has been working and another outside council have been working to get these um, agreements and their agreements with the town and the two nonprofits, <coughs> excuse me, and also a historic preservation restriction for both um, properties um, that have to be executed. And then we also have to document, which we have done, the public use of both the old Schwab Mill, which has a wonderful museum um, and still ongoing um, frame making and a wonderful gallery, and Jason Russell House, as we know, is one of the biggest, most important revolutionary um, war sites in this part of the country. 
and they are always opening their lawn and their house to any time um, town meeting wants to come. And the um, exact details of this is in this report, and you're seeing the pictures behind me that show the Jason Russell House um, deterioration, and we're paying for an engineering study and some of the um, restoration work. And in the old Schwab Mill, we're paying for a roof on a very important outbuilding of um, that, and it's because it's historic preservation that has to be done with w wooden shakes and done exactly correctly. Um, I'm here tonight, as are the old Schwab Mill and the Jason Russell House people, to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. If you have any questions about Article 4 or 5, now's the time to raise them because when we're done, we're going to vote 4 and then in rapid succession vote 5. Okay, Mr. Trembley, you're next. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. You're welcome. Ed Trembley, Precinct 19. Uh, just out of curiosity, Mr. Moderator, do we know how big the... Uh, Roof is on the uh, Schwann Mill barn. Miss Rowe, do you have any um, idea? Could one of you um, tell me how big the roof is? A thousand square feet. A thousand square feet. So that's 10 squares. $20,000 for 10 squares. That's a lot of money. It is. It's, it's a wooden roof. So are you, are you going to be sending people up to oil it? Because wood roofs require a lot of maintenance. They do and require does, does, a lot. And there's a reason we quit using them a couple hundred years ago. The thing about this um, is that we have to uh, restore these historic resources to the Department of Interior Standards. And as the Jason Russell House people know, they would love to use a, a fiberglass gutter. But the historic resources people of the Mass Historic Commission and our own Historic District Commission would not allow fiberglass gutters. Of course they're going to work better. We know that. We're practical human beings, but we're restoring historic resources, not trying to make them last forever. It would, if, if we were trying to get them to last forever, we would be having an asphalt roof. Wait a second. Isn't, isn't that sort of the purpose of historic preservation, is to get it to last? Yes, with certain materials. You know, I just came back from Italy, where the houses there were built in 1100 or 1400, and they're still in good shape. But you know something? The Italians don't seem to mind um, using materials where it makes sense to make their buildings survive. Uh, would it make sense to really lean hard on the historic uh, commissions to get them to recognize that maybe we have some better building materials now than we did uh, 300 years ago? I can talk to them about it if you'd like me to. Uh, I think that would be great because uh, $20,000 for a, for a roof is kind of a lot of money, especially when you're going to have to come back and ask us to replace it again in a few well, years. Well, it would be nice to get the roof fixed so that we don't have to do any more maintenance to the building. Well, well with we'll a roof, you're going to be doing a lot of maintenance to it, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Now. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Leonard? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Mr. Moderator, I'm wondering where both of these places, it just occurred to me that both of these places are listed on the National Historical Register. I brought it to the attention of town officials last year when we were talking, I believe, about the Senior Center that money might be appropriated from the Department of Interior of the federal government to assist in the preservation of historic buildings, provided they meet a certain criteria. And if that is the case, I'm wondering would any CPA money have to be used whatsoever if they meet the criteria of the Department of Interior? I'm not sure Ms. Rose's committee explored that. Uh, Mr. 
um, chapter lane? Did anyone explore that? One of the, I can talk a little bit about historic preservation grant. Because I, oh yeah. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, I, I think to be fair, in this specific case, the Jason Russell House and the Oshawa Mill are private entities, so it wouldn't have been the town researching whether or not grant funds were available. Right. They, they might be um, eventually um, able to work in the historic tax credits, which is something that Arlington has looked into. There is a list of something like 30 to 40 different buildings in the town of Arlington. Correct that are listed on the National Historical Register, which would qualify, as far as I've been able to tell, with the Department of Interior to have some kind of assistance done. And I'm wondering if it would be a savings for the CPA. It certainly would be. Um, one of the problems with the federal programs for historic preservation is that they, in the last um, decade, have been severely cut. And we had something called America's Treasures, um, which was a wonderful matching federal grant program that did a lot of restoration all over Massachusetts. But that was um, stopped during a previous administration. Could I gather then that some investigation will be taken in regards to pursuing it with the Department of Interior for these two buildings? I'd like to bring that up to the Arlington Historic District Commission, who will be in charge of historic places in the town not with the CPA committee. Okay. You have to bring it up with the Arlington Historic District Commission. While we are on the subject, <clears throat> excuse me. Of the Strom Mill and Jason Russell House. Right. Yeah. Would, would it be appropriate at this particular time to ask, has the CPA received this year's funding allowance from the state? Um, we will receive it on November 1st. Would that be, as the original agreement stated, dollar for dollar? The original agreement was not dollar for dollar. Last March, the Department of Revenue assumed that we would get a 19% match to the local surcharge. We will probably get about um, a 29% match on the local surcharge because of $10 million that Governor Baker put in to the um, Community Preservation Act fund. Bless you. Bless you. Not to split hairs, Mr. Moderator, but I have a booklet here from 2002 from the Vision 2020 that basically says the state provide matching grants of up to 100%. Up to. Up to. Okay. It was that never was guaranteed. In, yeah, that was, if we had adopted it in 2002, that would have been the case. It's no longer the case because it's a very popular um, grant program right now. There are 167 communities that have adopted it, and there are many more on um, the ballot in November. So it will be <clears throat> it will be a subject of conversation. I've noticed year. that because of the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, and with the existence of CPA since 2000, not half the communities in Massachusetts have signed up for it, and we're, it makes somebody we're, wonder. We're not debating the I wisdom of the I CPA understand. article or I the understand. state's handling of it. We're debating whether or not to give money to these two well, here is buildings, my, and that's what I want to keep. Here is up. my final point, Mr. Okay. Moderator. I was going to suggest that we're, I believe that we're talking about 91,000 set aside from last year. We're talking about... Yes, that's the reserve. 91,000. And so we're using 55 of the 91. Right. I think it's 94, but I may be wrong. Yep. Would it be something to consider, and this is my final point, of maybe holding off on one of these projects only because with a state basically right now is having tremendous trouble balancing its books? I would like to think that maybe we should hold one of these projects off in kind of like a rainy day fund in case, as usual, the state does not deliver. You can vote against the articles if you wish and make yeah. that argument to the crowd. Thank you, Mr. Moderate. Thank you.
Tom Michael Moon, Precinct 7. Um, Mr. Moderator, could we have some more elaboration on exactly what constraints there are in building material associated with um, these historic buildings? Um, we can, and I will do my best. I'm a landscape architect, not an architect. But what these buildings require is replacement of the materials that they were originally built with. I think that's a very simplistic answer, but that outbuilding of the old Schwab mill had a wooden roof, a wooden shake roof, and that's, the, that's why it's being um, restored with that material. Also, in the Jason Russell house, which the, the $35,000 is a lot for a structural study because the building is bowing out. If you look, if you go along um, Massachusetts Avenue and, or go down Jason and take a left on Massachusetts Avenue, you will see that the front of the building is beginning to bow out. So w one of the things that we do with the CPA funds is to look at the reasons for the material deterioration. And that's what the part of the $35,000 is. And could you confirm, uh, Mr. Moderator, that there is um, a need for uh, replacing uh, the roof? Um, maybe we can go back to the picture um, on the left. And I granted it's pretty small, um, but you can see on the, on the right hand side, there's a lot of deterioration on the roof. There's moss growing on the roof. The trim is deteriorating. <coughs> That's good. And Mr. Moderator, can we find out um, who is responsible for an, um, asking for the grant, for grants or um, matching funds for a CPA project? Is it the applicant? or is it the, uh, the committee? I think the way it works is we raise $6 billion and the state gives us 25% of it. No, the question was within a particular project, when, when a project is submitted to the CPA, they can have, they have, they make a request for funding. They can request all the funding or part of the funding. And part of that funding can be offset by, um, by funds from the applicant or funds that the applicant gets from grants. But I'm wondering, does the applicant have to proactively do that or does the CPA committee? The, the, applicant, oh, the applicant does it. In fact, the Jason Russell House got a grant from the Mass Historic Commission, Historical Commission f to do additional work at the Jason Russell House because of the CPA funding that was coming down the line. So that's one of the things the CPA does is they, it really um, lights a spark to get other grant funding. Obviously we, we have a lot of um, historic resources in Arlington and we need a lot of them repaired. So one of the things that we hope in our committee is that this is the beginning of these applicants like the old Schwab Mill and the Jason Russell House and the Arlington Historical Society and the um, Arlington Historical Commission all going and getting grants. And they, they're the ones that research and they're the ones that come to us and ask us for the money. So these, um, so they, they're leveraging, they're putting in not 100% of the funds. And then above and beyond that, we get the 19% match from this right. extra match from right. the state this year and the 29, expected 29% match next year is that my understanding is that correct we don't know what the match next year will be but, it, but I'm assuming it's about it will be in about 19 percent one of the things that we are very lucky in Arlington to have is two nonprofits like the ones that run these two historic resources because they have been keeping these resources going for many hundreds of years and they're in pretty good shape and um, they're visited by more and more visitors every single year that um, we have the historic signs up, we are gonna be on the scenic byway, we're gonna get more and more visitors and I think they deserve a real vote of confidence for their stewardship of these two um, resources. So thank you very much, I'll definitely be voting for the article. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Bahama.
Good evening, uh, Guillermo Bahamon, Precinct 14. I just, I just want to give a, a few sort of quick answers. Uh, the roof needs to be replaced right away. Otherwise, you'll have more damage if, if it's not replaced this fall. It's just $20,000, a thousand square feet. Uh, maybe the, the total cost may be 20,000, may not be 20,000, because once you take all the, uh, all the shingles, you, yes. they, you, you'll discover a lot of rock. Yeah. You, the the copper might, might not be in good shape. So it Guillermo, is something, can you speak it is something that mic? we need to do right away. You gotta speak right into the mic. Uh, it's something that we need to do right away. So it's just, it's just like when we need a new roof, we don't say, let's wait for grandma to die so we'll, so we'll get an inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, uh, then on the other thing, on the other, on, on historical grants, just forget it. The state doesn't have it. The federal government doesn't have it. The federal gov government does not fund replacement research. Replacement research is just the regular repairs that we need to do on our public buildings or historical buildings or schools every day of the year. So that, that's also wishful thinking. We need to bite the bullet and do it right away. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Smith. Scott Smith, Precinct 5, motion to terminate debate uh, on both articles. On articles 4 and 5. Yes, we have motion to terminate debate on article 4 and motion to terminate debate on article 5. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? No. Debate is terminated on both articles by a vote of two-thirds. I so declare it. That brings us to the recommended vote of the CPA committee as printed in your report. As soon as Tim's ready, P please press Please press one for yes and two for no. And go ahead and vote. One for yes, two for no. This is Article 4 we're voting on now. It's an affirmative vote, 186 in the yes and eight in the negative. Vote and I so declare. That closes Article 4 and brings us to Article 5. As soon as Mr. I can't remember his last name today. I'm sorry, Tim. Um, as soon as he's ready, we're going to vote on Article 5. Same thing. As soon as we get the green light, one for yes, two for no. This is. Vote is 184 in the affirmative, 10 in the negative. It's an affirmative vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 5 and brings us to Article 6, Bylaw Amendment Vacant Storefront Maintenance Registry. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dan Dunn, uh, member of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, this article has been largely, has been very much driven by uh, the town manager and we as a board have been very happy to support it, uh, but the person who can best explain the article and uh, its intent and impact is town manager Chaplain. Did you want to do your thing? Yeah. Good evening, Adam Chaplain, town manager. Uh, so article six uh, really started with uh, the combination of uh, a large amount of citizen concern expressed to me, to the board, other town officials, regarding uh, a legitimate concentration of vacancies in Arlington Center and also uh, in Arlington Heights to some degree. In fact, if, if I remember right, uh, I think the town moderator had one of the test poll questions at last spring's town meeting about how many vacancies there were in Arlington Center. Guess who did? Um, so this is something we've been talking about for a while, and we have been... Um, primarily through the town manager's office and the planning and community development office, taking a very collaborative approach with property owners to try to understand why their uh, storefronts are vacant and what we can do to be of assistance to help them fill those vacancies. Um, however, coming out of some of those discussions, we also felt that coupled with that collaborative approach, uh, we needed to pursue uh, a regulatory approach to make sure that we were 
um, really coming at the issue from both angles to see what we could do to lever property owners to be sure that they were filling their storefronts, if at all possible, and maintaining vibrancy in the commercial districts. So the proposal you have before you tonight would be a bylaw that's crafted um, based upon what a number of municipalities have done. Uh, however, most of those municipalities have done this based on residential property vacancies. Mm -hmm. So this would be a vacant commercial storefront property registry. Uh, what we would be doing is having any uh, commercial landowner who has a vacancy for more than 21 days register with the town uh, that such vacancy exists. And then after um, committing to such registration, they would then have to meet certain maintenance requirements in terms of public health, public safety, and aesthetic requirements uh, within the commercial district. Uh, this bylaw would not force them to fill the storefront, um, but rather it would have us be able to track it, have them be on record as to why it's vacant, and um, have us have data on how long some of these vacancies are occurring, and hopefully facilitate even more strongly the dialogue with these property owners about uh, filling those vacancies. So, again, I want to say, um, you know, we've tried within the limited uh, legal means we have as town government to be responsive to citizen concerns and our own concerns about vacant storefronts uh, and what we've put before you tonight with the my office, Planning and Community Development, Town Council, and voted on by the Board of Selectmen uh, is an attempt to give us uh, a bit of a tougher regulatory tool to hopefully match up with our collaborative efforts to start to deal with some of the vacancies in our commercial districts. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Heim, you're going to make those two changes? In reviewing this with Mr. Heim, we noticed there are two um, words left out. We're going to add administratively, so get your, get your motions out. Doug Heim, Town Council, just two quick notes. Uh, in the various iterations of this that were developed at various different times, there's two administrative corrections. Doug, you ought to speak right into the mic. Doug Heim, Town Council, in the various iterations of what you have before you, there were two administrative corrections that were noted to me. One is in section one, line five. It should read, commercial and industrial vacant properties. The word property should follow vacant. So that's, again, section one, line five. It should read commercial and industrial vacant properties, not just vacant. And then second, in um, section two definitions, uh, vacant building, the word non-residential is meant to be in front of commercial industrial real property, so there's no confusion about what we're talking about. Commercial and industrial properties are generally terms of art here in Arlington. When we say commercial industrial properties, we don't mean uh, two-family homes where somebody's renting out, you know, the other half of it or apartments. So it should read, definitions, vacant building, non-residential, commercial, or industrial real properties. Thank you. Okay, did you get those? So on the line five, right after the word vacant, we're adding properties and on the definition of vacant buildings, the non-occupied, non-residential, commercial, or industrial properties. We wanted to make sure it was people didn't think if you had a two-family home and it wasn't rented, you were going to have to register it. This is for commercial properties. Um, gentleman over here with the glasses, yeah. Hi, I'm Daniel Jalkut from Precinct 6. Um, I want to just rise to speak a little bit in support of this, especially in light of the fact that I've seen some news coverage that frames this, I think, in a way that sounds more punitive towards landlords and business people than I think it actually is. Um, I saw something uh, today that framed it as the headline was something like, town to decide whether to penalize uh, landlords for vacancies. And I think my reading of this proposal is much more uh, better summarized by saying that the town seeks to take stock of the situation with respect to vacant commercial properties and to put some, um, some measures into place that will formalize how the town can both understand how much vacancy we have and ensure that that properties are kept up in a way that 
makes them both safe and to the extent that it's reasonable, make them not appear like a kind of public blight that appears obviously vacant. There's language in the uh, proposal that says the property owners should do things, you know, like um, attend to garbage that's left or graffiti that is painted on these properties. And I think that most reasonable people in the town would agree that that's something that especially a property owner in our business district where so many other business people and landlords are dependent on the overall image of the town would benefit from these property owners who have the vacancies just sort of um, pulling their own weight in that respect. So um, actually the, um, the way that it was framed I think in the news article I saw was something like they could be fined. Some, I mean, the fine is almost neg it's, it's almost not even worth discussing because it's it's you don't even get to the fine aspect of this that that really I think matters to a, a degree that most business owners would or landlords would would care about and t unless you are grossly like negligent and defiant against the requirements of this um, proposal uh, and I think it comes down to one hundred dollars a day if you are actually either defiant or negligent about the specific rules that are laid out in this proposal. Otherwise, I think the main cost to landlords, if I'm understanding it correctly, and maybe I can make this a question, am I understanding it correctly that the main cost to landlords who are not defying the proposed bylaw would be the annual registration fee? Mr. Chapley? Adam Chaplin, town manager, yes, that is correct. And can you tell me, uh, just to reiterate for the clarification, what that annual registration fee is proposed to be, or is there a proposal yet? Um, it, we, have, we have not uh, set the annual, we've set the penalty, but we have not set the annual registration fee. We would come up with what the administrative cost of managing the registry would be, uh, but I, I wouldn't imagine it would be you know, any really significant amount of money. Okay, one little like persnickety point I, I, I noticed reading through it was, um, I think, you might be subject to the annual fee as soon as you are considered by the bylaw to be vacant, and I believe that happens um, after you are vacant for 21 days or more. Um, so I guess just to speak to the concerns of people who might be worried that that's, I don't know, too quick or something, um, is that something you considered whether uh, somebody who say takes a month to rent out their commercial space should be subject to registration and then paying an annual fee if they're going to rent it back out a week later let's say is that something that am i misunderstanding that or is that how it would play out that somebody would be expected to pay that immediately after 21 days so they would be expected to register after 21 days, but there would be opportunities for them. They could be expected to pay it, or if they were going to be able to put public art in the windows, they wouldn't have to pay it. Or if they were able to demonstrate that they would be immediately filling the vacancy, we would be able to have an opportunity via the Director of Planning and Community Development and the Director of uh, Building Inspections to waive the fee. Okay, thank you. Um, so my overall takeaway, especially with that clarification, is that this proposed bylaw would set up a system where, yes, there would be a new obligation for commercial land, uh, landlords in town primarily to have their vacancies on the book with the town so the town has the opportunity to decide what they're working with. Like, do we try to work with those landlords to convince them that there are opportunities to rent to people? Do we try to go out into, I don't know, public sector to say like, hey, we got a lot of uh, opportunities here with vacancies. The um, punitive aspect of this is very slight in my, my impression. And um, that $100 a day, it's only if you're in violation of the bylaw, which more or less only occurs if you refuse to either register your property when it becomes vacant, or you refuse to clean up graffiti, clean up trash, or you refuse to um, cap off utilities that are going to be not used for like a long period of time, I think it's six months or more, or you, you know, otherwise basically defy the spirit of this bylaw, which is to say, if you're going to have 
unrented property in Arlington, we want to know about it. So we have the opportunity to encourage people to try to rent it. And we want you as a landowner to keep it safe and keep it att somewhat attractive so that it doesn't um, deter the public from taking advantage of all the other great rented out business we have in the town. So I think that sums up my position. I am going to be voting for this and I think it's a modest move. It's not a major move at all. It's something that <coughs> encourages us to get a better grip on what's going on. If you go down this main strip in town, you know it's an issue and this is a really modest way for us to get a grip on it and try to make a small change in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jelka. Mr. Yonter, do you have your hand up? Yep. Tom Michaelman, Precinct 7. Um, Mr. Moderate, can we find out um, whether there's any difference in uh, property taxes for um, vacant and unvacant buildings, commercial properties? Mr. Chapdelaine. Adam Chapdelaine, Town Manager. Uh, yes, uh, myself, the Deputy Town Manager, have done a lot of work with the Board of Assessors and the Director of Assessing to, uh, to figure this out and get a, a clear answer on that. The way commercial property is assessed is through the collection of rental data that allows the assessors to set a uniform market rate for, uh, for commercial property. So there's one rate that is applied to all commercial properties. One individual vacancy does not in and of itself give any commercial property owner a tax reduction. However, uh, I guess it is important to note that should they file for an abatement, they could use those facts uh, appealing their way up to the appellate tax board. But in terms of our own tax policy and the way we administer taxation or, or assessments, no, there is no discounted tax rate for a vacancy. So that leads to a second question, which is uh, how prevalent is that request for abatement um, uh, asked for and given? Uh, Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. So I, I don't have that data with me, but from our conversations with the assessor, my sense was it's very infrequent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Mr. Ruderman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, moderator. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. I'd like to ask two succinct questions before my remarks. Uh, can someone speak to the uh, matter uh, on the fourth page uh, underneath Section 5C? Has, is there nothing in our existing regulations regarding health and safety in town that prevents a property owner from being required to clean up trash and graffiti? and Similarly, is there nothing in our present bylaws, or should I say, has there ever been the situation where the town's inspectional services department has felt it was necessary to enter a property and cap off utilities immediately? Have either of these two conditions arisen outside of our present uh, regulatory structure? Mr. Doug, can you answer about the bylaw? And then we'll get the building inspector about capping. Come on. Yep. Mr. Burns can answer about capping. Good evening, Michael Byrne, Director of Inspectional Services. Um, not to my knowledge, has there ever been an emergency to, for us to go into a property and cut and cap it? Thank you. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager, uh, just quickly speaking with uh, both Mr. Feeney and Mr. Heim. Uh, it seems that there's, there's nothing as specific to commercial property owners with the specificity about accumulated trash and graffiti in existing bylaw. Thank you. Uh, like I said, I live in and represent Precinct 9. Precinct 9, whose border is the uh, northerly sideline of Mass Ave, pretty much from uh, the, the foot of my own house. Uh, up the street. These are my neighbors. This is my neighborhood. In the last uh, couple of weeks, I've had the opportunity to speak with uh, quite a few of the tenants and property, uh, commercial property owners along that stretch of Mass Ave. 
And I can tell you that they agree with me to a person. They are not in favor of this bylaw. They are not in favor of leaving properties vacant, but they are not in favor of this bylaw. They and I say that except for the one situation that we've just had clarified for us here, where there's nothing specifically in our existing regulatory structure that allows someone from the town to come in and say, your property is trashy, your property is covered with graffiti, you've got to clean that up right now. There's nothing in this bylaw that assists the property owners. There isn't. It forces them to manage their business affairs in such a way that if they choose, you know, I don't know logically why, but if they choose or if they've been unsuccessful in getting the tenants that they want, they have to register with the town. Think what that means. You have to put your name on a list as if it weren't possible for the folks from our planning department to do tomorrow what they did uh, in the springtime and the summertime and go out and create a list of vacant properties for all to inspect. That, you know, simply being on a list doesn't help the property owners. Certainly it is in their own interests to maintain their properties in an attractive fashion. The town's not helping with that. The town is not providing any marketing, any consulting, any planning or studies, perhaps you could uh, adapt your property in such a way, invest this and that change, you appeal to a different sort of tenants. No, there is nothing in this bylaw that comes back to the property owners in terms of helping them manage their businesses. No, instead, this bylaw says we want to have a list so that we can know who and where you are. Now I'm leaning into the microphone for, for dramatic effect. Take away the dramatic effect and just think of the words. We want to have a list so we know who and where you are with your commercial properties. They already know this. They're not going to provide any help in accomplishing the goal of a commercial landlord, which is to conduct business, make money. There are a couple of lines that I think are the most telling in the way this bylaw is written. One is section 5E, compliance with this bylaw, bylaw shall not relieve the owner of any obligation set forth in any other applicable bylaw, regulation, code, covenant, condition, restriction, association, regulation. Two minutes. So basically, we're reminding you, you have to follow the law here. Section eight, unsafe buildings. If the building inspector determines the building is unsafe, the building inspector can act in accordance with Massachusetts State Building Code to protect public safety. That power already exists. We're creating a regulatory framework whose sole object here is to create a regulatory framework and to charge the regulator par regulated parties for the privilege of being regulated. They're not being assisted. In fact, I would seriously disagree with the previous speaker. $100 a day, you've got a piece of commercial property, you are stuck. You don't want to tear it down, but you can't find a tenant? What are your options? And the time has run out and the town now says, $100 a day until you get somebody in here. No. Excuse me. I misspoke. Yep. I said so. The town is imposing a structure of fines to achieve an end which it cannot help, which it cannot further, which it cannot promote, and which it places the burden on the individual property owners to achieve themselves. So I will vote against this. Thank you, sir. Mr. Dunn. John Dunn, Precinct 19. I am a small, uh, I own two small pieces of commercial real estate in Arlington. So as one of the little guys, this warrant, Article 6, concerns me if I had a difficult time renting my space. It is a hardship for me, and I feel this warrant creates even a bigger hardship for the little guys. 
I understand and appreciate the, the basis of this warrant article, but it seems a large number of vacancies in Arlington's business district is due to one to two landlords. Having your property considered vacant after 21 days and beginning the registration process, along with fees, possible fines, seems unreasonable. I agree that the property owner should maintain these properties in accordance with local state codes as stated in section five. Of the warrant article, I am concerned with the vagueness of the registration process and of the fees and the fines associated with this warrant article. At this point in time, I would ask you to vote no on warrant article six until we can fully consider the necessity of this warrant article. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Mr. Fisher. Uh, I would urge a, a yes vote. Um, I don't think the idea is, oh, I'm sorry. Andrew Fisher, Precinct 6. Um, I, the, the stores that are vacant now, especially Madrona Tree and across the street there was a gift shop, were very clearly empty because the landlord performed what was, in my opinion, price gouging. And if this bylaw can make life at least have some consequence for landlords asking for exorbitant rents, um, I'm all for it and I will vote yes. Uh, I would go much further and at least, maybe it can't be done in a bylaw, but establish some sort of legal framework where when a landlord raises the rent and causes the tenant to leave, um, if, if the uh, property can't be rented within six months, obviously it was price gouging or three months or one year. And the landlord should be held liable for destroying the, ten the business's property. I mean, the Madrona tree, whoever, they build up a reputation, they build up a business. That should be regarded as a real value piece of whatever you call it. Just because it's not real estate doesn't mean it's not real. And that's been destroyed by somebody that was, it should be regarded as price gouging. So I will vote yes for this. I don't see why we should be concerned with holding their hands. Um, we're supposed to see business people as having risk. They don't seem to have any risk. Uh, please vote yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Mr. Fuller. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. I have a small question that might yield to an administrative correction. Um, at, toward the end of the motion, section eight, unsafe buildings, it reads, if the building inspector determines the building to be unsafe, the commissioner may act immediately. Uh, that appears to be the first and only mention of the commissioner in this motion. Can we find out who this mysterious person is? <laughs> Mr. Hahn? Doug Heim, Town Council. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. I appreciate that. The, uh, in the definition section, uh, you're correct. Um, for the most part, we refer to our uh, building inspector uh, as an inspector or as a zoning enforcement officer, not as a commissioner. So if we need to make an administrative correction, I appreciate that. It should read uh, inspector, not commissioner. So it will read building inspector. Yes, Sounds good. I we apologize for not bringing that to you sooner. I didn't read the thing closely until the Cleveland-Toronto playoff game was over tonight. So. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. um, I'm so. Cleveland won. They're going to the World Series. Um, I'm going to vote for this, I think, with respect to the comments of a previous speaker. It's not that punitive. It will certainly help the planning department and particularly their economic development people to make contact with landlords of vacant properties and say, we're here to help. What kind of tenant are you looking for? Let's help recruit. This can probably expedite that process. It's said that they know about the vacancies now, but the registration scheme will make sure of that. 
So I, I hope it passes, and in the event that it does, I hope the selectmen will set the registration fee at a very low nominal level. Thank you. Thank you. We will make that administrative correction, so make that in our section 8 of the article to cross out in commissioner and write in inspector. Um, Mr. Radosha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bob Radosha, Precinct 11. I do not support this Article 6 at this time because basically for the past 12 years, the town has neglected to maintain the infrastructure of the center up through town hall, including town hall. I believe it's unfair to the commercial property owners to penalize them for the vacancies when the town did little over the past 12 years to keep the center presentable and a desirable place to do business. I began in 2004 noting walking along Mass Ave in the center, two orange cones covering up missing light poles, 2004, 12 years ago. That number grew to seven over the next 10 years. I also noted at that time in front of the Jefferson Cutter House the granite post and rails, there were several rails missing, damaged, or whatever. That was back then, and to this day, today there are five missing and one damaged pole, rail, in need of paint. So we've had 12 years of neglect, no, no attempt to make that correct. And there was a period of three years recently where graffiti was stayed on the metered box in the Russell parking lot. It was three years. I've had photos of it, one year, second year, third year. It took three years for the graffiti on a public, and that was the town not doing its job and making it a presentable place. Um, the brick sidewalks remain hazardous with missing, heaved, and depressed bricks and attempts to patch it with asphalt patch that goes to show you that's a lack of concern when we're willing to just kind of throw some back black patch. The town exterior, the entrance out here, is, is a disgrace. It remains a hazard with the depressed uh, stone pavers and the elevated stone pavers. I watched some women cross over today, and you can see how they almost nearly trip, but they had to be careful about it. And the men's room has not had a 20th century, never mind 21st century, paper towel dispenser as, as long as I can remember. It's on the radiator cover and you roll it out, all right? I don't know about the women's room, but the men's room, it's been that, somebody could verify it one way or another, please. All right, litter and trash can always be seen out here in the garden. Uh, years ago, I made a request to get some barrels put out there but the answer I got back was, and I think I have it in writing also, if we had them out there, they'd be filled with trash, and we don't have anybody to pick them up. Now, these are just examples of what we don't do to maintain a property that we want to be proud of, like Lexington, Winchester, Belmont. You know, you walk those streets, they feel good. I know people that live in Lexington, they pay high taxes, but one, one of my friends said to me, you know, I know it's high, but, you know, I feel as though I'm getting my money's worth here. And sometimes we pay a lot of taxes, we complain about it, and we're not getting our money's worth when we treat the center as it is. So these are examples of why I don't support it. And until we make this whole thing presentable and we repair the sidewalks, it's not a question about um, removing seven parking spaces and putting in meters. That's not going to make the difference at this point. Unless for some reason, people think if we have meters, we're going to bring in people to do business. That's not it. And furthermore, I think we're losing. Somebody might be towed out here in the citizens' parking lot because they're going to tow cars after hours out there now. So, uh, yeah, did you see that, the signs? Yeah, they're out there. So, and then the other thing I'd request, not to do with anything to do with this, but if we could delay Let's bring time. it back to the article. Okay. Uh, th this is, uh, okay. That's, that's why I don't support it. And I'd like to also ask if we could uh, delay the time of town meeting because I don't want to put money in the meters to be here at 8 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.
Mr. Moore. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14. I have one question about, I'm, uh, let me back up. I'm generally supportive of the notion of maintaining the center as a, a place to do business and a place that's attractive for other businesses to, to uh, join us. I am a little um, confused about section five. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here about maintaining the buildings. That makes sense, fixing the windows that are broken, et cetera. Section, or, yeah, uh, part C, second sentence. The owner shall maintain the condition of the building and the property so as, appear, so as to appear not to be vacant, which feels like a very aggressive standard. I'm wondering if, uh, Mr. Moderator, we could find out what's really intended there. Because often, a, often a, a vacating store owner will remove their fixtures and the building is, in fact, empty. Mr. Heim, can you tell me what the thought process was behind that portion of the bylaw? Doug Heim, Town Council. Uh, obviously, you're dealing with a somewhat uh, subjective standard. But I think when folks spoke to the town about their concerns, about commercial vacancies, one of the things that they're trying to reflect is a concern about the aesthetic impact on the rest of the businesses around town. If you look next to uh, Common Ground, for example, right now you'll see a bunch of shutters half pulled up, half pulled down, some sort of twisted, things like that. Um, I don't think it's meant to be overburdensome as much as to give us some sort of means of saying, look, you know, we know your property's vacant. We're allowing you to place advertisements in your windows. We're providing a vehicle for waiving fees by displaying public art. Let's have these vacant properties look presentable. And I, other than having an exhaustive list of what presentable means, which I think would only create more problems, mm -hmm. I think we've got to trust that our, you know, inspectional services and planning staff have some ability to read this type of bylaw and state, you know, this is what we mean by something that doesn't appear vacant. We don't want so, broken windows, things like that. So the intent is good repair and yes. attractive presentation, not to simulate a lack of a vacancy. I think that's a good characterization. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'll be supporting this, thanks. This gentleman in the fourth row, yeah. No, 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 right behind you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charles Hartshorn, Precinct 1. I had a question. Would this apply to the industrial properties that are outside the center, like the old transmission place? Mr. Heim? Doug Heim, Town Council. Uh, yes, it does. And I, I want to actually state something very briefly on that because there's been a few points of discussion about where this applies and where it doesn't. Uh, one of the things that's tricky to balance in any type of bylaw like this is to not uh, punish certain property owners by virtue of exactly where they're located um, so that people in the Heights carry a disproportionate burden to commercial properties in East Arlington or vice versa. And uh, while there's an expansive discussion about this, industrial properties for some similar reasons, some a little bit different, were included in it. So industrial properties are generally included in it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now you, sir. No, no, not you. Not you. You wait on the list. <laughs> Him, he had this thing. He was so excited before. Uh, Greg Christiana, Precinct 15. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I have a question, uh, I'm not sure to whom to direct it, uh, about um, uh, the, what I'd like to know is, is there any estimate on the number of vac current vacant storefronts that would be in non-compliance and would be subject to the, the penalties in Section 7? Mr. Heim? Doug Heim, Town Council. There's someone who can probably speak better than I can to the number of vacancies, but there are no uh, storefronts currently in violation of the bylaw because the bylaw sets a scheme out where a vacancy has to exist for a certain period of time, and then there's a registry, and then only if you fail to sign up for that registry or fail to abide by the requirements set forth in Section 5 would you be in violation and therefore triggering a $100 a day fine. Great. Thank you. So it sounds like, by definition, no one could actually be in, in violation right now. So focusing on the appearance, would any uh, current vacant storefronts, by dint of their appearance, be in violation? I'm not sure Mr. Byrne has done such a survey yet. He would be the one who would be responsible, I believe. Have you looked? Oh, Adam's going to try and answer. Adam Chaplin, town manager. So uh, as we've been 
looking at and dealing with this vacancy issue. Uh, the building inspector I know has done some code compliance checks uh, and just some, some, some status checks on various properties. So I, I wouldn't want to guarantee it, but my, my sense is that at least the vast majority of the vacancies right now would be complying with those maintenance standards. Um, so it, it wouldn't strike me as though there is a large quantity that would immediately, you know, once the 21 days had passed, if this was to pass, would instantly be sort of in default or in violation. Um, but there, there certainly could be, you know, one or two that I'm, yeah, sorry, there, there certainly could be one or two that I'm not um, immediately aware of. Great. Thank you. I'll be supporting this. I think it's very reasonable and pragmatic. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. I move to terminate debate on the article and all associated matters. We have a motion to terminate debate on the article. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? No. In my opinion, it is a two third vote. We're ready to vote on the article. Lathwood is ready. Um, we'll vote one for yes if you want the article, two for no if you do not. Go ahead and vote. One for yes, two for no. One is if you want it, two is if you don't. It is an affirmative vote. 136 in the affirmative and 57 in the negative. The bylaw so passes. The vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 6 and brings us to Article 7. Acceptance of legislation, use of parking meter revenue without appropriation. Yes, sir. Uh, Carl Wagner, Precinct 11, point of order. I just got some new glasses. I sit in the front row. I still can't really read the blue on red, so I don't know if it's possible when we have to change things if we are supposed to look at that. Could somebody please change the color coding for future? Thank you. Dave? It will be done. Your wish is Dave's command. Ms. Ms. Mahan, are you going to tell us about parking meters? Mr. Chapdelaine is. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, so earlier tonight you heard Mr. Carmen mention the Municipal Modernization Act and these next three articles all deal with um, pieces of the Municipal Modernization Act that town meeting would need to adopt for the town to gain access to what's allowed uh, under, those, um, under those parts. And, and I think it'll be a continuing trend uh, at town meeting in the spring as there's literally hundreds of pieces of the Municipal Modernization Act that will be, we have been working through and will continue to work through uh, and potentially be bringing more recommendations to town meeting. Uh, specifically, uh, the article that's before you is in regards to the use of parking revenues to be uh, expended on acquiring and installing parking meters, uh, paying for that acquisition and installation over five years um, directly from the parking revenues received, uh, not subject to appropriation. So prior to the Municipal Modernization Act, uh, that could be done, what I just described, the acquisition and installation, and then paying for the meters directly from the parking revenues without further appropriation, uh, could have been done without the acceptance of the legislation. The Municipal Modernization Act uh, updated that language of that statute requiring local acceptance. So we did enter into an agreement for the meters that you've um, all seen being installed uh, in Arlington Center under the prior statute, but with the uh, passage of the Municipal Modernization Act, not only did we want to be consistent and make sure that we were trying to remain in compliance with the, the new statute, but also have the flexibility to, uh, to be able to pursue it or access it in the future. Uh, so that, that's what's before you is the acceptance of the statute that allows us to directly take parking revenues to pay up to a five-year agreement for the acquisition and installation of those parking meters. So just uh, to sort of describe how this would be working, uh, there's approximately 225 meters that are being installed in Arlington Center, street parking meters. Um, if there's an 85% occupancy rate uh, at a dollar an hour, which is the, uh, the rate, uh, it would be just about $700,000 annually collected. Uh, at a low estimate, a 50% occupancy rate, uh, an annual um, just over $400,000 would be collected. 
So functionally, what we would be doing um, is paying the, we would be collecting those funds, transferring them or depositing them into a special, a special revenue fund, paying the annual equipment lease for the, for the, the meters, which is just about $52,000, and then taking the remainder of the funds and putting them into the general fund. In the future, uh, I can see in the spring, we will most likely be coming before the body and asking for further adoption of a statute within the Municipal Modernization Act that would allow us to create a parking benefit district. That has been part of what we've been talking about as part of this Arlington Center parking management strategy for a long time. That would allow us to take a portion of the revenues that I'm talking about tonight and then directly apportion it back to investments in Arlington Center. Um, that, that is not what we're talking about tonight, but that's a future potential use of the revenue. So. I think that um, I think that covers everything I wanted to mention. Um, again, we we entered into the current program under the way that the prior statute had been written, and we wanted to uh, ask town meeting to consider adopting this so that we would seemingly remain in compliance with the new statute, uh, as well as have the future flexibility to access that uh, authority. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Some questions, if I may. After talking with various residents in the town, I've been informed that there was at one particular time parking meters in the town. Could somebody elaborate as to why that policy failed and they were taken out? Do we have any idea when that was? Do you know when we had... Mr. Chapdelain? I don't remember meters. Adam Chapdelain, town manager. I, I can only relate an anecdote that was shared with me that when a prior long serving town manager uh, made some decision that the, they were either too hard to maintain or, or, or too much of a, a, a pain and that, that they should be taken out. And, but that's an anecdote that I heard. I, I don't know when they were actually removed or what the legitimate reasons were behind it. It would be interesting, Mr. Moderator, if we could learn the lessons of why they were taken out, but maybe that will come in the future. Second of all, if this is not approved tonight, Article 7, for the acquisition and installation of parking meters, does it mean that the work that has been done so far will be taken out because the money won't be there? Mr. Chapline? Adam Chapdelain, town manager. No, so we, we did legally enter into the contract under the prior writing of the statute. It would just mean that in the future we wouldn't be able to do, uh, do it in the same manner. So the stanchions and the, the, the project would continue on? Yes. Okay. I'm curious, Mr. Moderator, on what some of the local businesses in the town of Arlington have said, especially those who have been here since the meters were in the first time what their opinion is of the meters. Mr. Chaplain. Adam Chaplain, town manager. So we, we did conduct a pretty thorough um, engagement process uh, several years ago now as we developed a parking uh, management strategy as well as uh, working through and finally making a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen for the adoption of the installation of meters on uh, Mass Ave and, and um, certain side streets in Arlington Center. And, you know, I, I would say there, as with anything, there's a mixed reaction from property owners, though I would say there's a, a number of commercial property owners or business owners who understand that if we want to turn cars over, if we want to make sure that there's parking availability, that parking meters are, um, are an appropriate strategy. I, I've heard it myself. I've heard it secondhand. So, um, again, a, a, as with anything, it's mixed, but I certainly know there's um, there's support. I will also say the Chamber of Commerce has had a representative on our Parking Implementation and Governance Committee that's been working on this. Uh, the Arlington Center Merchants Group has had uh, a representative also on that group. So there's been um, representative of business groups at the table. They've been supportive. They've been putting their feedback in as 
in regards to how we implement this and how we manage it, uh, but we've definitely had a business with a seat at the table and a voice in these discussions from the start. One last question, Mr. Moderator. With the comments that I have heard through the town in regards to how Mr. Leonard, the center of town is dark as all heck with the new lights. Is there anything you could do about it? I'm wondering, will the new meters have any lights on them that can be seen so that people know how much money to put in if they are faced with such a problem at night? Are the meters backlit? Adam Chaplin, town manager. Uh, yes, the meters are backlit, so they, they will have their own lighting within, within the meters. Uh, and if I may venture just slightly out of scope, uh, it has been a little dark in the center as part of the Arlington, safe, uh, Arlington Center Safe Travel Project. You may have noticed that two of the light poles in the, in the median strip across or, or between the Cambridge Savings Bank and the Jefferson Cutter House were taken down as part of the project. Those will go back up and some of the darkness that has legitimately been there will be, uh, will be gone. I will be voting against this article. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Uh, it's like 9.40. Usually we take a break. Do you want to have a break? No. Okay, all in favor of a break, say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Mr. Jameson. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, I... I, I queried the manager um, and spoke with him before. Uh, first of all, I'm in favor of this because I think it's going to turn over, um, make the parking spots turn over in the center and drive people to the long-term parking. If they're going to be there a long time, rather than sitting out front, they're going to go to the big lots. Um, so, so, so as the manager alluded to, the money will go into a fund and um, perhaps you can say yes or no uh, that, that I understood correctly. So let's say it's the $450,000 revenue thing. The cost means that 50000 of that, which is the cost of the program, would come off and the other four hundred would go into the general fund. Is that correct, Mr. Moderator? Mr. Chapdelaine, explain the finances to us one more time. Uh, Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Yeah, I, I very specifically discussed this with the comptroller in preparation for tonight. So the entirety of the collections would be deposited into this fund. The lease payments or the agreement payments for the meters would be paid. And then at the end of the year, the proceeds would then be deposited into the general fund. Okay, so two follow-ups, if I may, Mr. Moderator. Um, so if there was no cost, then all the funds would be transferred. If it got to a point where there was no cost for the program, all of it would be transferred to the general fund. Um, and the timing is the, the transfer goes in the general fund at the end of the year. Does that mean it has to be certified as free cash and, and loop around to the next year until we can use it? Yeah, in the absence of us adopting something in regards to a parking benefit district, as I mentioned earlier, it, that's how it would work. So perhaps when you, when you get to that point, you might think of having it be a calendar year operation where that way it could be appropriated during the normal town meeting. Yeah, we, we, could, we could look into that. Um, and then this will accrue as local receipts? Yes, we, as the revenue from the parking meters uh, in, the, in the two town lots currently do, yes. Okay, thank you very much. I will, again, I, will, I support this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Trembley. At Trembley, Precinct 19, I find it uh, interesting that we just uh, passed a bylaw about uh, vacant storefronts and we're putting up uh, parking meters which if the experience with West Medford is any any uh, indication will result in more vacant storefronts. Um, West Medford has had, I think, uh, I think the merchants that I know over there told me that they had about a 40 percent drop in business after they put parking meters in. Um, so, so Mr. Moderator, I do have a quick, uh, couple of questions. Uh, one of them is, is this uh, parking meter uh, fund, will, will this allow the town to expand the location of parking meters without, uh, without having any... Uh... Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. So I guess the answer is a bit nuanced. 
Uh, the Board of Selectmen, as the parking commissioners, could decide to put parking meters um, virtually anywhere it seemed appropriate. So this, uh, adopting this in and of itself wouldn't expand the powers of the Board of Selectmen to do so. It simply um, depicts the manner in which it could be paid for. So it gives them the money to do it if they so choose. Correct. Okay. And uh, I guess one thing that concerns me a little bit, we've, we've had uh, the, the example for the last decades of Congress and Washington abdicating their responsibility to, uh, to manage the purse. And, and I think that town, this is the town meeting purview is to, is to manage the, uh, is there, well, not manage it, but uh, look over how the town sends, spends money. And this seems to be a way of, uh, of uh, going around that. Uh, what, could you tell me what the difference between a this and a revolving fund is? I mean, the revolving funds we get to look at, but uh, is, there a, is there a difference here? Mr. Chaplain. <clears throat> Adam Chaplain, town manager. It, it's different from a revolving fund in that it's authorized under a different statute and doesn't it's not necessarily governed by the same rules as a revolving fund. Um, this would certainly be something we would report about in the annual financial plan, and we could even talk with the finance committee about including a section about it as an, as an appendix to the to the finance committee's report to town meeting. So, um, and, and it's also it's not revolving because it's not taking the entirety of the proceeds and then expending it towards a program. It's taking a portion of the proceeds, paying for one specific uh, acquisition or capital asset, and then putting the rest into the general fund, which revolving funds do not do. Okay. I'm sorry, if I, if I may, so revolving funds carry a balance. So every year at annual town meeting, a revolving fund, uh, a whole report on all the revolving funds in the town comes before town meeting, and you can see the revenues, the expenditures, and then the balance that's carried into the following fiscal year. Here, there would be no carried balance. It would be collected, the amount needed to pay for the acquisition and installation of the meters would be paid, and then the remainder would go into the general fund. So there would be no carrying balance in this account. And if we don't vote for this, it's not going to really mess anything up per se. It's just going to require that the town has to appropriate through town meeting any, any funds that they want to use to pay for new parking meters or whatever. That's accurate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Koch. Kevin Koch, Precinct 16. Mr. Moderator, how are, I'm concerned about people who park on Medford Street waiting to pick people up. Are they all gonna be dinged for, for parking? Thank you. Adam Chaplin, town manager. So the Board of Selectmen actually voted on Monday night to instate 15-minute free parking at all of the meters. Uh, there's a button um, on each meter where if simply pressing the button would give you 15 minutes free. And the intention of that is for pickup, drop-off, takeout, uh, running in to get something from a convenience store. We're not, we're not trying to inconvenience people. We're trying to make sure people don't park so long that the businesses don't prosper. So uh, providing 15 minutes free so that people can go in and quickly do their business, uh, whatever it might be, if, if they're leaving in 15 minutes, we're still achieving our, avail our parking availability goal. So um, that's how we're trying to address that matter. Mr. Wagner. Uh, Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move to terminate debate on the article and all associated questions. Motion to terminate debate on the article and all questions. It's been seconded. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? My opinion, it is a two-thirds vote. As soon as Mr. Lathwood is ready, one, you want to adopt this article, two, you do not. One for yes, two for no. And go ahead and vote. One for yes, two for no.
Is it affirmative vote? 156 in the affirmative, 25 in the negative. It's a vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 7 and brings us to Article 8. Article 8 and 9 appear to be pretty similar, except they're different speed limits. Why don't we talk about 8 and 9 at the same time? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Diane Mahan, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 14. Uh, j just very briefly, and I'm, I'm going to ask the town manager to come up and answer the second part of this question. When I first got involved in politics and was a brand new baby selectman, it was much to my shock and chagrin that uh, t town officials and department heads and selectmen didn't get to set speed limits. And for years, under then Senator Havern and Representative Garbley, I and others across the Commonwealth would file uh, home rule legislation to try to say in certain areas and neighborhoods that appeared before us, could we lower the speed limit from 30 to 25 or 20? And that basically was pretty futile. Um, so now, thankfully, some seven, eight years later, under the Municipal Modernization Act, um, this is Article um, 8 and 9, basically authorizes the board, by a vote of this town meeting, to consider just that case, whether to 25 to 20. Now, it's not something the board would just go out and do on its own and, and not seek any outside input. So if I could ask my colleagues on town meeting, could I call up the town manager to outline the process he's re recommending to me and myself, my colleagues on the board, as well as my colleagues in town meeting, that if one or both of these were to pass, what the process and protocol would, we would go through before we would actually institute a lowering to 25 or 20. Mr. Chaplain. We have six minutes and 47 seconds left. <laughs> Adam Chaptoin, town manager. Uh, so um, as the chair just did, I'll speak to both uh, articles eight and nine. Uh, so both of these again are from the Municipal Modernization Act. So article eight would allow the town to reduce what's called a statutory speed limit. Uh, you might be able to call it a default speed limit. Most places in town that haven't had some other decision made by uh, Mass DOT has a, have a speed limit of 30 miles per hour. Uh, acceptance of um, this new statute under Article 8 would allow the town to consider reducing those uh, statutory speed limits down to 25 miles per hour. Um, so what I, what I would be recommending to the Board of Selectmen is that if Article 8 is adopted, that we refer the uh, matter to the Transportation Advisory Committee, or TAC, have them assess what the appropriate process would be for the Board of Selectmen and TAC to consider requests for a reduction to 25 miles per hour, or more than likely, more preferably, consider whether or not the town should be reducing its statutory speed limit across the board to 25 miles an hour. But I would leave that, uh, or I would recommend that the Board of Selectmen refer that to TAC for their analysis, opinion, and recommendation. Article 9 is specifically in regards to safety zones being able to reduce the speed limit to 20 miles per hour. Uh, MassDOT actually very, uh, in a very timely fashion sent us some um, guidance just yesterday in regards to this whole matter. Uh, and there are uh, several criteria that are laid out for safety zones uh, and what would apply or, or what could, would comply with being a safety zone. Uh, they have to do with um, likelihood of vulnerable road users being using the road, uh, potential conflicts uh, of various, uh, various modes of transportation at certain parts of the road, or also certain proximities to crosswalks, driveways, or intersections. So similar to Article 8, if town meeting adopted Article 9, I would also recommend that the Board of Selectmen refer that to TAC for the recommendation of a process by which the town would consider where to establish these safety zones. Um, I, I don't th think those would be potentially as wide, widely used or expansive as uh, a potential town-wide reduction of the speed limit, uh, but I think a process in place for people being able to petition for safety zones would be uh, something that would be very valuable to the town to have in place. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, Scott Smith, Precinct 5. I'm going to speak in favor of this. I'm also a member of a Transportation Advisory Committee, or TAC. Uh, and uh, try to be brief. First, I want to report that earlier this evening, TAC voted unanimously to support the Selectman's recommendation on this article, even though we know we're going to have to figure out how to implement it. And, <laughs> uh, and wanted to quickly review 
you know, some of the background. What's the current speed law? You know, everyone says it's 30, and that's not quite true. It's actually reasonable and proper speed. And then, then it goes on to say, well, if you're going faster than 30, that's prima facie evidence. It's not reasonable and proper. And the reason that's important is over the years, we've done many, many speed studies, and we're finding that many of our local streets, not all, that you know, your median speeds chosen by motorists tend to be less than 30. You know, for our reasonable drivers, you know, not the speed demons, or, you know, say many streets that are already obeying this. <laughs> and uh, so I think if we were to go to a lower speed limit of 25 on some roads, it would send the message to really the minority that's doing like 35 now and it's hard to have enforcement. And so why is this important? Thank you, next slide. Um, so dugout, this is, you know, most of Arlington is thickly settled. We have thickly settled means you have pedestrians and and the risk, if a car hits a pedestrian, the risk of injury or death increases enormously as you get up faster than 30 miles an hour. Uh, okay, a little blurry there, sorry, but bar on the left is like 10 to 15 miles an hour, and then 40 plus miles an hour, it's almost certain to have a serious injury or death. So I think that the reason to consider this, you know, is simply safety for all of our road users. So it, urge you to support the selectman's motion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's the gentleman right in the back. Yep, you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Timor Yantar, Precinct 7. I believe I am in favor of this uh, warrant article, uh, actually both warrant articles, 8 and 9. Um, out of curiosity, though, I would ask, well, let me first say, I, I, I believe I support them because I support uh, public safety, and I believe lower speed limits would, would uh, achieve that. Out of curiosity, though, I would ask what the town contemplates regarding uh, enforcement of compliance with the lower speed limits, whoever might be appropriate. <laughs> Chaplain, chief's not here. Adam Chaplin, town manager. So um, you may recall at town meeting last year, we uh, actually requested in town meeting approved two additional police officers uh, to be added to the police department specifically uh, to staff up or, or further staff our traffic unit for traffic enforcement. Uh, they actually, uh, the, the new uh, class of officers just graduated from the academy two, two weeks ago. Uh, so we should be able to be getting that traffic unit up to force and have um, more, uh, more police on patrol uh, to do traffic enforcement. So uh, I, I won't claim that it's necessarily going to be uh, enough everywhere all the time, but I think it would at least give us a better chance to adequately uh, enforce what we're talking about here. Thank you. Glad to hear it. Again, I believe I support this. Thank you. Mr. Jalka. Daniel Jalcut, Precinct 6. I move to terminate debate on Articles uh, 8 and 9 and all matters related therein. We have a motion to terminate debate on Articles 8 and 9. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? No. In my opinion, it is a two-third vote and debate is terminated. As soon as Mr. Lathwood's ready, we're going to take a vote as printed in your report on Article 8. One, if you want the 25 mile an hour speed limit, two, if you don't. And go ahead and vote. One for yes, two for no. It is an affirmative vote, 157 in the positive, 19 in the negative. And so declare it. That closes Article 8 and brings us to Article 9 for a vote. As soon as Mr. Lathwood's ready, go ahead and vote. One for yes, two for no. Yeah. 
Number nine is also an affirmative vote. 151 in the positive, 19 in the negative. That closes Article 9 and brings us to Article 10. Do we have substitute motion on Article 10? Mr. Warden. Quiet, please. Mr. Warden has the floor, apparently. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Shh, John. Quiet, please. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Warden, Precinct 8. Um, Mr. Moderator, I move the uh, substitute motion under I move the revised substitute motion under Article 10, um, which is the sheet that was on your chairs tonight. Um, and it is not the one that you got by email uh, earlier in the week. It's been revised in, in two respects. And the reason, the reason for that is um, that this afternoon, uh, uh, Mr. Chaplain, the town manager, and I had a, a, an exchange by email back and forth, and uh, uh, it, it, his, uh, his main concern was that we change the 50 cubic yard minimum uh, 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 amount uh, to, to get a, a non-hearing a non, uh, exemption uh, to, to 500, uh, and I, um, I, I, I agreed that uh, I, I would do that in exchange for his speaking in support of the article. Um, as you, you no doubt know, uh, th this, uh, th this, this summer a developer suddenly started banging away at a huge rock ledge in Irving Street, a ledge about 20 feet high at the dead end of that street, if you're familiar with it. The noise was deafening for anyone nearby and could be heard as far away as the bike path and right here in town hall. Small uh, earthquakes were felt several hundred feet away. Nearby properties were showered with rock fragments, dust, and tiny stone particles which can have severe health impacts. To everyone's amazement, no permit was required because the developer claimed he was not selling the rocks. This went on for nine hours a day, five days a week, for six plus weeks. When, when average people heard about this, a typical reaction was, that shouldn't happen to anyone. How can I help? Town officials expressed sympathy but said there was nothing they could do. The Board of Health said the excessive noise could only go on from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., the hours that the developer was already working. They measured the decibels a couple of times, and even though they exceeded the allowable limit, uh, they did nothing since the average was below the limit. Just about everybody in town, unless they were living in a cave, uh, uh, knew what was going on, uh, as did the redevelopment board, but they d proposed nothing. They received our warrant article on September 7, but didn't hold a hearing until 40 days thereafter. Then they issued a report to town meeting recommending no action on the day before the meeting. Is, is ambush the right word? If they had all these concepts as outlined in their report, why didn't they reveal them earlier? The report is even mathematically challenged. They seem to think that 600 is 1,000 more than 300. If you remodel your bathroom or kitchen, you have to get a permit. If some neighborhood uh, teenagers have a loud party, you can call the police and they will shut it down. We even have a bylaw that says you can't shine a light into your neighbor's property if, if she or she, he or she uh, objects. But a developer can come on to the lot next door and bang away at rocks and ledge for weeks on end without any permit and you can't do anything about it. Does that make sense? This situation is widely reported in the Advocate Your Arlington the list Yet there was no movement to do anything, despite a, uh, 
so, so when uh, I read in the Advocate on Thursday, August 25, that there would be a special town meeting, I, I decided to file an article. We did it, got uh, 235 signatures very quickly through volunteers, and we filed it on September 7. Uh, the art after it was filed, we made some modifications to exempt small projects, such as moving a few boulders or something if you're building a porch. And um, we provided no notice or public hearing was required for certain other projects, um, uh, which now um, include projects up to, to, to 500 cubic yards, which is a lot of stone. But um, that, is, uh, uh, that, that is what Mr. Chaplain and I ha have agreed to. Um, so, um, the bylaw is proposed, may not be perfect, uh, few are, uh, but we have an opportunity to do something now that will take effect shortly and will save people from this kind of aggravation during the, the next construction season next spring and summer. Uh, if, if we pass something, we wait till spring town meeting to pass something, it won't take effect for almost a year from now. And so people will be subjected to all that difficulty uh, and, and, and trauma and, 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 and a lost summer, if you will, uh, for, um, uh, for all that uh, additional period of time. If you live in the north or west of Mystic Street, Pleasant Street, there is a rock, rock outcropping somewhere near you. That unbuildable lot or that small house, slab on grade, is suddenly ripe for exploitation. If you live in East Arlington where you don't have rocks, remember that we in the Heights are your neighbors too. We voted to expand your Thompson School, your almost new Thompson School, by an overwhelming majority. And, and so, we, you know, we are, all, we are all one town. We're all in this together. So we, different parts of town have to help our, each other despite the different uh, situations. So please vote yes on the motion to substitute and yes on the motion to substitute. Thank you. Okay, do I have a second on his motion? And is it, Mr. Warren, just to clarify, it's the one that says revise substitute motion? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we all have that in front of you? Okay, good. Um, Vanell? Good evening, Andrew Bunnell, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Warden's motion in front of you this evening is not the motion on which we voted no action the other uh, Monday night at our meeting and public hearing. However, uh, as Chair, I can, I can only speak for myself, but we would still oppose this motion. Uh, most importantly, at town meeting last spring, there was a substitute motion on the table that passed overwhelmingly to create a uh, citizens committee under the purview of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, comprised of uh, a number of residents in town to focus specifically on residential zoning issues. That committee has been staffed by a number of zoning experts who are very well qualified to present very good legislation to town meeting uh, come this spring that I think will, will accomplish some of the, the things that this legislation seeks to, to cure. Um, it's not a perfect piece of legislation. Mr. Warden is right. It's far from it. Uh, 500 cubic feet, uh, cubic yards is minimal. Uh, it's a very, very small amount of rock to move from a piece of land. Typically in, in bylaws like this, you'll look for something like 3,000 feet before it has to go in front of, uh, in front of uh, a planning board or the ZBA. Um, this residential study group has this issue on its radar. They are exploring it among other things and I, and I want to emphasize that this group is staffed by zoning attorneys, it's staffed by planners, it's staffed by people who have extensive experience in rewriting and researching zoning laws and, and codes. Um, this is a hastily put together piece of legislation that while I think the intent of it is noble, uh, I don't think now is the right time. I think it needs additional work. Uh, needs additional baking in the oven before we bring it out. In the meantime, uh, this won't be a lost summer. This won't be an issue where people are forced to live through uh, the kinds of unique 
situations that I think this, this one project, this Irving Street project, posed to the neighborhood, there are enforcement mechanisms in place in town already. Uh, they're not in the zoning bylaw, they're under the general bylaw. Uh, Article 3 concerns open excavations, uh, which, which states, and I'll, I'll read only in part, uh, Owners of land which has been excavated shall be required to erect barriers or take other suitable measures to protect persons from damages incident thereto. They're already required to put up fencing. They're already required to put up barriers that protect their neighbors. Uh, there's already a noise abatement bylaw in the general bylaws. Article 12 protects that. Uh, it's, it's incumbent upon the people of town to complain about uh, developers and homeowners that, that might be going outside of what's allowed, but we have a very good enforcement staff in town. Uh, they can't be everywhere at all times. It's incumbent upon people to, to let them know that some of these things are being violated and that there are things that can be done. Um, in addition, even the current required public hearing notice under this bylaw exceeds by 100% the currently existing notice required, or I suppose the proposed uh, public hearing notice exceeds by 100% the current notice of 300 feet. Um, Definitions of rock in this proposed bylaw aren't adequate. They don't adhere to best practices uh, under what's typically acceptable in these zoning bylaws. Uh, the proposal includes a recommendation for site plan review, which actually would fall under redevelopment purview and not under the purview, purview of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, town meeting did an excellent job last spring in nominating this uh, residence committee, this citizens committee. I ask that you wait until the spring, let this committee do its job and bring some better, more thorough, more protective bylaw proposals to you in the spring. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. David Bean, Precinct 8. Um, could we have the, the video first? Uh, I, I, too, support this motion. I live about 100 yards from where the uh, jackhammering was taking place this summer. And uh, uh, it took me a while to realize what was going on. There was a constant tap, 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 tapping that started early in the morning and continued all day long. Uh, each day, of course, I thought, well, that's the end of it. It'll be gone tomorrow. And it wasn't. It kept going for six weeks. Um, besides the annoyance of the noise and dust that the project caused, I'm also concerned by the potential of unregulated rock removal to alter the beautiful topography of our town. I don't think we'll, we could actually lose whole hillsides, whole hilltops as uh, Somerville and Boston have historically, but uh, Boston, Arlington's uplands have a wonderful roughness that I think lots of us love. Um, I suspect we're not actually going to hear the, the uh, noise in this video but you can, you can see it. Uh, I guess someone had a drone and flew in. Here's, here's some of the machinery and <coughs> trees that were taken out. Um, that's, there's the noise on the computer is what, what we could hear. And it was as if somebody was downstairs in your house using a chisel all day long. Uh, you can see the kind of, the kind of uh, work that went on there. On the, uh, the orange sheet that was provided to you, there's a, uh, a URL on there for a, a YouTube video, uh, which looks like it's probably not quite correct, but if you use that, you can uh, enjoy, this, uh, enjoy this repeatedly. <laughs> That wasn't part of the project. Um, the, the substitute article uh, has uh, uh, a limit of 500 cubic yards or less as the, uh, the cutoff for requiring uh, a hearing and, and a permit. Could you, uh, uh, there. Um, here's one of the, the well-known uh, cuts on Mass Avenue up by Wanamaker's Hardware where uh, uh, a big piece of hillside was taken out to create parking places. Uh, I went up and measured this. I, I decided that this particular one was about 100 cubic yards. 
uh, removed from this basically triangular section. Uh, an architect who lives close to me estimated it was probably closer to 200 cubic yards. But anyhow, uh, this is less than half, this large amount is less than half of the amount of stone that uh, uh, would trigger the uh, uh, requirement of a hearing to remove it. I think, uh, I think this is a, a good a good start anyway, and uh, we need to do something to uh, protect other people from this kind of thing next summer. Uh, I collected a lot of the signatures for, for this article, and in many times of canvassing the neighborhood for this or that, this was by far the easiest uh, uh, signature collection of them all. I think that if a project like this takes place in your precinct, you'll find the uh, uh, reaction of, of your neighbors is about the same as it was in ours. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mrs. Warden. Patricia Warden, Precinct 8. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Fellow town meeting members, Irving Street neighbors were tortured for over six weeks this summer, heavy industrial operations in this non-industrial residential zone, working from home was almost impossible. Toxicants, air pollution, flying rock pieces suddenly happened. Air pollution was reported to the police. It's particularly dangerous for children and seniors. It can cause asthma, heart attacks, reduced lung function, irritation of eyes, nose, and throat, and increased vulnerability to diseases such as diabetes. It can affect children so badly that they can never enjoy sports. A 93-year-old neighbor told me it was the most horrible summer for her and her husband. She hopes no one else would ever have to go through that, and she hopes we will approve this article. This article does not prevent development. It is about safety. That is all. It is necessary because buildable land is scarce and so builders are now building a ledge which they can drill, drill, drill into oblivion. East Arlington town meeting members, precincts one through seven, we need your votes. Without your yes vote, this article will fail. The article will not affect you because East Arlington does not have ledge all over the place and so you won't be needing protection from pollution from ledge excavation. 50,000 years ago, East Arlington was ocean and north of Spy Pond was ancient, rocky, mountainside ocean front. Your soil is sandy, not rocky. But please be sympathetic about the rocky terrain in the rest of town. You need to know that I have a master's degree in medical sciences from Harvard Medical School, a first class honors degree in pharmaceutical chemistry from the University of Glasgow, and a doctorate in molecular biology from Harvard University. Four of my immediate family members are practicing physicians, one son, one son-in-law, one daughter-in-law, my youngest sister, with whom I often discuss health matters. With jack hammering of rocks, pollutants include invisible fine particle dust which penetrates deep into the lungs and can cause, among other things, silicosis, a painful and debilitating disease which is irreversible. Irre Reversible. It is a life sentence of ill health. Neighbors pleaded for mitigation, but all that the town got for from the developer was one or two days of totally ineffectual general area water spraying, nothing near compliance with the code of federal regulations for these activities. Children, infants, toddlers, and even young adults up to 20 years of age are extremely vulnerable to damage from particle pollution. The child's respiratory system is immature and must develop for many years. This development is very complex, anatomically and biochemically, and fine particles are drawn further into the lungs in children. Near these residential ledge excavations, there can be little babies with extremely delicate respiratory passages and also seniors being subjected to the same hazards as at industrial sites without the monitoring or mitigation 
that is mandated for industrial sites. In fact, we have zero monitoring, no oversight, no protection, nothing. The developer's trump card, not to be political, is speed. He comes in fast with a blitzkrieg of industrial machines, leaving neighbors horrified and shocked with no way to find out about the project and too late to arrange for children to get away to a safe place. Health and safety of residents in town are the first responsibility of appointed and elected persons in town, including us here at town meeting. No child in town should be placed at risk just because parents bought a house which happened to be near a lot with lead that a developer decides to develop. Neighbors requested help from the Board of Selectmen, the Board of Health, the Building Inspector, the Town Engineer, and the Town Manager. But they did not find any of these officials felt there was any instrument in town available to them to help. So we don't want this to end up like in Flint, Michigan. Their residents tried to get local and state officials to help reduce lead levels in the water. The can just got kicked down the road. Um, from one official to another with no solution and eventually residents had to solve the problem themselves with the help of researchers. Two minutes. Likewise, here in Arlington, residents also tried to get state help but the can just got kicked back to the town with no solution and it has now reached us here at town meeting. Um, we can vote yes on this article and bring the town the instrument it needs. Pertinent state and federal safety regulations are being ignored in favor of safeguarding developer profits. So one or two more engineers who are familiar with state and federal standards and regulations should be appointed to the Zoning Board of Appeals, at least as alternates bringing expertise to resident protection Consultants should be used if necessary. Maybe the Arlington Redevelopment Board could share the wealth. They have 13 paid staff members and frequently use consultants. I can't emphasize enough the seriousness of this situation, especially for children. Young children have incomplete respiratory epithelium, so air pollution exposure can do a lot of damage. It can take weeks or years for symptoms to develop, if this article saves even one child from lung damage, it will have been well worth your vote. Please vote yes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Band. Hi, Carol Band, Precinct 8. Um, Patricia's right, this, this project was horrific and it, it did put the neighborhood through hell for eight weeks during the summer. Um, I live about a half a block away and it was, it was loud and the town was, was unresponsive because frankly there was nothing they could do. There was no regulation in place. We called the town manager who was very nice but he said I can't really do anything, call the Board of Health. We called the Board of Health and they came and they said, yeah, you know, it's loud, um, but we can't really do anything. So we do need some kind of regulation. Um, the Board of Selectmen voted no action on this uh, proposed article. And I would like to s wonder if the language could be changed, Mr. Moderator? Can we, if we change the language sufficiently, can we resubmit it in April? Well, you, you have three, two, or three. You have a couple of options. You can either vote Mr. Warden's. Yeah. You can vote to amend it slightly. You can vote no act. You can vote it down, or you can vote to refer it to the residential zoning committee. But if we ended. if we vote no action, you said it can't come back for two years. But if we change the language, can it come back in April? Mr. Heim. Doug Heim, Town Council. So there's a couple options available. Uh, with respect to the main motion, uh, we have a pending motion for no action. So it's difficult to uh, bring it back without the uh, 
uh, agreement of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. So the Arlington Redevelopment Board can allow it to come back in earlier than two years, but any motion that is subst substantively the same on a zoning matter that fails um, can't be brought out, can't be brought back without the agreement of the Redevelopment Board. So how, what does substantively different mean? Or to I don't want to, so this is in the, within the purview of the town moderator, but a substitute motion has been filed by Mr. Warden, for example, on the no action recommendation of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. At this point in time, any further changes to Mr. Warden's motion would have to be uh, acceptable on uh, town meeting floor yeah. within the discretion of the moderator. The only other option is to seek to uh, withdraw a motion, um, although I'm not, I'm, given the fact that we have a recommended vote of no action, I don't know that um, unless the redevelopment board also wanted to withdraw their no action motion, their, their vote of no action, so that the entire matter has been withdrawn. Um, you can't withdraw it. Okay. Your only other option is to do a substitute motion to refer it to a committee. And we vote one of the two substitutes, yes or no. If we vote them both no, we, then we go back to the no action vote. Well, I certainly have to defer to the moderator on, on the rules of town meeting. Yeah. Okay, Those thank you. Um, I, I think there is an urgency with this issue, and I think that it, if we wait long, that the land in Arlington is so valuable that it's being snapped up and it, we're going to have houses jammed into what were previously unbuildable lots. Um, okay, thank you. Mr. Moore. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14, in the Heights with the ledge. Um, it sounds like a really unpleasant thing happened, um, but I have some questions about whether this is really the right way to address the problem. My first question, Mr. Moderator, is if uh, we made a choice to, for instance, refer this to committee, and we came back with a, a, a change in the bylaws at the Springtown meeting, when would uh, the, the change become effective, if we did it in the special town meeting in the spring? Okay. If if we, if we made a change in the special town well, we meeting, we don't know if we're going to have a special next spring. Oh, if don't it, we generally do it? Only if Adam wants to do something really quick and spend money before the AG comes back in July. I see. Otherwise, you have to wait to the new fiscal year, July 1. And then we wait for the Attorney General to approve any changes to the bylaws, and that usually takes the end of the summer. But yeah. Once they've been approved. He's going to give you the exact time frame. So typically, uh, the Attorney General's office for a Springtown meeting won't uh, have a uh, won't have approved a zoning bylaw until sometime around the end of the summer. Um, there is some question, which is getting a little bit too thick into the weeds for a potential uh, zoning bylaw amendment about whether projects are uh, put on sufficient notice that they have to uh, abide by a pending uh, zoning proposal. Thank you. I think Mr. Chaplain wants to elaborate as well. Adam Chaplain, town manager. Uh, just to, to help with this conversation, I do anticipate either during the annual town meeting or maybe even prior to next year's annual town meeting, there being a need for a special town meeting uh, to consider appropriating funds for the renovation of the Gibbs School. So if that town meeting were to occur and we were to make a bylaw change at that meeting, when would it become effective? It has to go to the Attorney General for approval. Once he approves it, or she approves it, I'm sorry, then the town has to advertise it for two weeks in the advocate. After those two weeks, it becomes effective. Uh, if we're lucky, yeah, 90 days. Okay, so 90 days if we're lucky. Yeah. Okay. Not the end of the summer, which would be the, the more normal timeline. Right. Uh, okay, August, thank April, you. April, May, um, June, July. That gives us a little bit of an idea of what we might have as an option. Um, but I think the thing that's really important for today's discussion is that this is not the right response to this problem. Um, it looks to me like the current zoning bylaw says we can't have rock quarries, gravel pits, and for some reason sod farms. Uh, that's the, re the reason I presume that we can't sell the rocks. Um, the problem here, though, isn't rocks. It's not even really removal of rocks, as far as I can tell. The problem is noise and dust. We do have a noise ordinance, 
and I think we've heard that maybe it's not adequate to our needs. If we have a noise ordinance that doesn't do what we want, well, let's fix the noise ordinance rather than creating a separate law about certain kinds of equipment being used to remove rock. I'd rather just fix the noise problem. If we have a noise problem, let's fix that. If we have a dust problem, let's fix that. It makes a lot more sense and will cover the problems that we actually perceive. So I would like to make a motion to refer this to the Citizens Committee. Okay. Can, can I, I get that in writing and can I get a second on that? Okay. Thank you. So come on up and put that in writing. Next on the list is Mr. Berkowitz. Referring the Citizens Residential Zoning Committee study group, whatever it's study group. <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> Bill Berkowitz, Precinct 8. Yeah. <clears throat> Bill Berkowitz, Precinct 8. As I see it, the Larkin Redevelopment Board has a responsibility uh, directly or indirectly to safeguard the welfare of the residents of the town. I would like to say that the Redevelopment Board is doing its job with distinction. Judging by its actions over the past year, I'm going to need a little bit more convincing. I appreciate Mr. Bunnell's remarks, but over, as you may remember, over the course of the spring town meeting, a number of articles, citizen articles, came before us as town meeting members to limit what number of people here felt was overly intrusive development. Uh, these articles uh, failed. Uh, the ARB recommended no action on them, <clears throat> and their view prevailed. So be it. We come now to another citizen article, which, as its proponents say, <clears throat> excuse me, was signed by 235 people, uh, and you've heard the reasons why, which I won't repeat. Uh, but the ARB, for reasons of its own, <clears throat> or actually reasons detailed in this report, uh, again, recommended <clears throat> no action <clears throat> for per perhaps very cogent reasons. I think this loses the sight of the larger picture, which is, as, as other people here have reported, uh, when this um, rock drilling occurred during the summer, uh, it was literally and figuratively uh, shattering. I live myself about, I measured, uh, 0.4 miles from the site of the drilling. Uh, if I step outside of my house during the summer, I could distinctly hear it. Um, you can imagine what it was like for the people who were the neighbors, the immediate abutters of, of the house. Uh, yet again, the ARB recommends no uh, action, uh, and the town was ab not able to help them. Something is wrong here. We can do better as a town, and we should. Um, the ARB's recommendation of no action is disappointing to me, despite the what, whatever the merits may be of its reasons. For several reasons, I think it could have done, could have acted differently. For example, it could have supported the, uh, Mr. Warden's motion as it was. It could have supported it as refinement, with, with some refinements. It could have formulated its own recommendations. It could have expressed at least minimum some sympathy for the situation facing the immediate abutters and those people surrounding uh, 108 Irving. It did none of those things. Um, that's disappointing to me. Uh, I am rising to support the original substitute motion presented by Mr. Warden as a first step, not as a final step, but as a first step in the process of making sure that these situations don't happen again. And I hear Mr. Moore's comments about other actions needed to prevent, to prevent noise and dust. <clears throat> Notwithstanding that, I think this is a first step we can take rather than delay, kick the can down the road, punt, or continue to take no action. I think the larger point that I would like to make, though, 
is that in any making in many planning decisions, a planning group we or we <coughs> must balance the rights of developers, <coughs> people who are developing, against those people who are impacted by the development. Uh, in my view, the ARB is giving the impression that it favors the developers, developer side, too much of the time. And I would like to encourage the ARB and, uh, to be more cognizant of the need, and for us to be more cognizant of the need to balance the rights of the developers uh, versus those people who are impacted by the development. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, this gentleman in the purple. Yep, you. Yeah, you had your hand up. Um, John Gersh, Precinct 18. First time addressing town meeting. Uh, I strongly feel like I want to support Mr. Warden's motion. I sometimes feel at the uh, mercy of developers and committees and studies, and, and I, this just seems like a really common sense way to give some protection to me and my neighbors up in Arlington Heights. That's all. Gentleman right next to him in the blue. Yeah, Mr. Belkus. You are on the list, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Belskis, Precinct 18. Uh, I stand here uh, in support of Mr. Warden's motion, and I oppose the uh, no action as proposed by the Redevelopment Board. Uh, and I speak from firsthand experience. And I'll tell you why I am standing here. December, early December 2014, Saturday morning, there'd been a lot of activity on the lot next door because they tore down uh, a small cape. I knew there was going to be something larger. But on this Saturday morning, the excavator that tore the building down was there with this huge device, one of the biggest jackhammers I have ever seen, and all they had to do was remove a little bit of ledge that they wanted to kind of expand the foundation a little bit. It went on all day. Pictures were falling off the wall. I should have brought the video that I made off my back porch where you could almost feel the vibrations and sense the pounding that went on. So we have laws that supposedly help us in these situations. So first I call the police department and ask them, because it's Saturday, none of the town offices are open. The police officer came down, he checked out the action and replied back to me that, well, they have a building permit, so there isn't much we can do. But I was aware, as a 16-year town meeting member, that some time past, we had passed some noise ordinances. So why can't we get the noise level verified? Well, the capability rests with the health department, and they're not open on Saturdays. So this continues all day. And believe me, until you've lived with it, and not just me, my neighbors, three and four houses away, and this is a relatively small, they weren't removing a huge ledge like in the previous example. This was just a little bit of ledge they wanted to remove. But you've got pictures falling off the wall. You've got glasses falling off the shelves. Uh, I probably have some cracks in the ceiling to go with it. Uh, so we're saying, well, the redevelopment board says, well, well hang in there. Uh, we got a study committee we put together. I applaud them for that. Uh, but this isn't going to happen for a while, okay? Uh, I'd like to flip the coin the other way. If we accept Mr. Warden's motion, well, next year, the redevelopment board and the committee that they have can come in with Warren articles that can adjust or change this. There's some immediacy to this Warren article. Until you've lived next to one of these situations, you can't appreciate how bad it is, and I appreciate it. 
and I strongly urge you to support Mr. Warden's motion and, let, and not accept the no action motion, and next year they can bring in their changes to what we're proposing here if it doesn't quite fit. Please, vote yes on Mr. Warden's motion and vote no on the redevelopment boards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phelps. Mr. Trembley. Good evening. Uh, Micah Trembley, Precinct 21. Um, I was hoping to come up here before you to terminate debate, but hearing after hearing some of the discussion go on about this, uh, this particular warrant article, unfortunately I feel I have to comment. So I oppose Mr. Warden's um, article, but I do not support the um, Arlington Redevelopment Board's vote of no action. The reason I, I excuse me, the reason I oppose Mr. Warden's article is because I believe it is bad legislation. And by bad le legislation, I mean it doesn't actually achieve what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is control no noise and dust from these construction sites. And okay, informing all the residents around an 1,800 foot radius is, is a good idea. But having the contractor just jump through hoops to, um, to get an approval, that doesn't solve the problem. Um, Mr. Moderator, Sir. could someone explain to me um, if the, the building department has authority to mandate certain safety regulations or um, procedures such as water, a spray water dust control system? Mr. Byrne, can you answer that? Or Mr. Hind, do you want to? Oh, Ms. Bongiorno's can answer for us. The health department. Christine Bongiorno, Health and Human Services Director, uh, Board of Health Representative. Uh, the Board of Health does mandate watering down of the site if there is dust that does go beyond the property lines. So that, that is the case. Okay. And um, I forgot my other question. Oh, uh, Mr. Moderator, I don't know, I open this up to the, ask you to open this up to the floor. Is there anyone in town meeting or in this room that knows of any other ways of removing a rock or ledge besides blasting and chipping? <laughs> Thor's hammer. Mr. Fisher, is there another way? There, there are wedges that use air compression, and uh, I think in, Inkins did it with uh, logs, which the way they would then make the logs swell with water. <laughs> so can you, yeah, you're, you're, none of this is getting on the record. So what she's basically saying, there were no permits issued for the Irving Street project. So yes. For the chipping, specifically. Um, can someone explain to me if that was part of the building permit plan? Whose plan? The, the moder Mr. Moderator, could so I, I ask, is, it, is the chipping and the, the process of being approved for the, the chipping, is, isn't that part of the building permit? This guy, he didn't, ish, he didn't go for a building permit because he hadn't put in that he's going to build the building. He just went up there and started chipping. He didn't need a permit to chip. Ah, okay. There's no requirement to report to anybody. He's, it's his property. Okay, I see. I missed that little detail. Um, none, nonetheless, I mean, I, I do feel for the, I do feel for the, affected parties. I know waking up at 7 o'clock in the morning and having a giant, giant 30,000 pounds machine, 30,000 pound machinery start chipping away at the rock next to your house is not 
a very pleasant or um, desirable situation to be in. However, I, I feel there should be, instead of just requiring them to arbitrarily go for a permit, especially if they are going for a building permit, um, I feel we should, we should review this legislation, um, come back to it in April. Uh, we're, I had some idea for, for an alternative, but have them put in the, the appropriate water um, dust control systems, maybe limit the amount of time that they can chip to four hours a day. I don't know. But this legislation does not solve the problem of noise and dust. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tremblay. Mr. Jelkut. Daniel Jalgut, Precinct 6. I move to terminate debate on Article 10 and all matters related therein. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate on Article 10 and all matters before us. So all in favor of the terminating debate, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, it is a two-third vote. Debate is terminated. Okay. So we have before us, pay attention, two substitute motions. We have Mr. Warden's substitute motion, which sets out parameters for new section 11.03, rock, sand and rock removal, et cetera, et cetera. So we have two substitute motions. Mr. Warden's substitute motion you have before you for new section 11.03, removal of sand, et cetera, et cetera. We also have before you Mr. Moore's substitute motion that would refer the matter to the Citizens Residential Zoning Study Committee, which we formed last spring. So we'll get a vote on those two substitute motions. One first, Mr. hold on a second, let me finish explaining what I'm doing, then you can ask your question. First, we're gonna vote on Mr. Wardens. If you wanna have the new bylaw, you're gonna vote yes to substitute Mr. Wardens. If you don't like Mr. Wardens, just vote no. If you wanna vote it to refer it to the committee, you'll vote for Mr. Moores. If, if you don't wanna refer it to the committee, you'll vote him down. If you want to have no action, you'll vote both down and go with the no action of the ARB. So you have basically three choices. Now this guy back here had a question. Yes, Mr. Michelson. There's a point of order on the voting. Correct. If they so choose. If, if they so choose. What you're, uh, we're talking about point of order on how we're going to vote. We're not continuing debate. Mr. Berkowitz, what's your point of order on the method of voting? You have to come to the record. You have to come to the mic, because we can't get this on the record. Bill Berkowitz, Precinct 8, wondering if you vote for Mr. Warden's article, can you also vote for Mr. Moore's, meaning that you vote well, for the substitute and review well, the larger issue to committee? They're mutually exclusive, in my opinion. Mutually exclusive, okay, thank you. Mr. Mr. Rearig, what's your point of order on the voting? Brian Rearig, Precinct 8. Mr. Moderator, what will your ruling be if both pass? Well, that's going to be up to the Attorney General. <laughs> well, I don't think so because we then have to take no, a vote I, on the main motion. I, I, so if we... If, that's why I'm saying they, in, in, they're more or less mutually exclusive, Mr. Eric. If you want the article, if you want to have this bylaw, you vote for Warden, you don't vote for more. If you want to refer, refer it to the committee for them to come back with further study, you don't vote for Mr. Wardens, and you do vote for the referral. If you want neither, you vote them both down, you go with the ARB no action. That doesn't mean the committee can't do what they want. It's... 
I, I Mr. understand. Mr. Heim, do you have a point? We could reverse the order, if that would uh, make them. If I may, Mr. Moderator, you still have the same problem. I understand you're suggesting to town meeting members that they only vote in favor of at most one of the substitute motions, but you can't force them to. I can't force and them to do anything. And if you wind up with a vote where both have passed, you need to tell us whether the second yes vote is going to supersede well, the first one or not. You have this, of course, the second yes. So that's, we'll reverse the order then. We'll go first to refer to the committee. If that doesn't pass, or if it does pass, we'll do substitute it. See, eh, this is the problem with all these substitute motions coming in <laughs> and having a one-day special on these sort of things in front of us. It's hard for legislation. Wait, wait, Mr. Heim is pointing out a technical point right now. Yeah. Oh, correct, yeah. Okay. No, no, not the substitute. It's not, it's not the substitute. Yeah, okay. All right. At some point, we're just going to have to go ahead and do this thing. Yeah. Uh, point of order, Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. It's my understanding that we were debating a substitute motion by Mr. Warden. In the midst of that debate, another town meeting member came in with a substitute on top of Mr. Warden's motion. Correct. So this would, in essence, be an amendment or a change to the substitute motion before us so that my understanding of the way the rules should work would be that the referral motion should come first as it is an amendment or a substitute to the substitute motion previous. Well, <laughs> excuse me, Mr. Yeah. Okay, so on reconsideration of how the order of voting will do, Mr. Moore first refer. Then we'll, come, come on, let me make a make a rule here. You didn't like the first way, I'm gonna do it the other way. So let me just think about it and come up with a scheme of voting. I would like to do Mr. Warden's first, but the meeting doesn't seem to wanna to do it that way. So, shh, quiet. We're gonna vote Mr. Warden's first. All in favor of Mr. Warden's substitute motion, please vote yes and Mr. Lathwood is ready. If you want Mr. Warden's vote, yes. If you don't want it, vote no. Mr. Wardens carries. So it's a, Mr. Wardens is substituted for the no action of the ARB. Now, Mr. Moore, if you want to substitute Mr. Moore's for Mr. Wardens, you'll vote yes. If you want to refer it to the committee, you'll vote yes. If you don't want to refer it and you want to go with Mr. Wardens, vote no. Mr. Lathwood. So if you want to refer it to the committee now, Right now, we have now substituted Mr. Warden's recommended, Mr. Warden's substitute motion for the recommended vote of the ARB. The ARB vote of no action is now out. It's Mr. Warden's is now the main motion. We can now substitute Mr. Warden's motion and refer it to a committee if we go with Mr. Moore's motion. So now it's, do you want to refer it to the committee for study or go with Mr. Warden's? And then following this, we're going to take another vote. So, Mr. Lathwood, if you want to refer to the committee, vote one. If you do not want to refer, vote two.
That is defeated. All right, we now have before us, when Mr. Moore is done, we're not going to refer it to the committee. Can you go? We now have before us a recommended vote of the ARB as substituted by Mr. Warden's motion. And as it's, hold on, it's zoning, so it has to pass by a two-third vote. We, we, had a, we had a substitute. We've now substituted Mr. Warden's vote. If you want to pass Mr. Warden's vote, you have to vote yes. If you don't want it, you vote no. And it's a two-third vote because it's zoning. All in favor of the article, please vote one for yes, two for no. One for yes if you want it, two if you don't want it. It's real simple. If you want the article, vote yes. If you don't want it, vote no. We're voting as amended and it has to vote by two-thirds. The final vote is 98 to 68. The article fails. It's two-thirds. It's two-thirds. It's, it's zoning. It has to pass by two-thirds. That closes Article 10. That brings us to Article 11. We have a recommended vote of no action. All in favor of no action, please say yes. yes. All opposed? Wait a second. Let's dissolve first. That closes all the articles in front of the... Mr. Foskett, please remove Article 1 from the table. Mr. Moderator, I move that the special town meeting Hold be on. dissolved. All in favor of removing Article 1 from the table, please say yes. yes. All opposed? No. That dissolves the uh, special town meeting of October 19, 2016. Thank you very much. Please return your clickers on your way out. Please return your clickers on the way out.